getting a head start on things today. Holy fuck. Right. Oh, one shit. minute early. Woo. Oh, I know. Okay, welcome to the 108th episode of the Nerdum and Other Nonsense Anime Podcast. Today, we'll be breaking down anime that aired during the 8th week of the summer 2019 season. I actually like that we're we're synced up for the rest of the season. But it's only going to last for like a couple more episodes, so enjoy <laughs> it while it lasts. <laughs> Uh, as always, we'll include timestamps in the description of the YouTube video and podcast feed. If you only want to hear about one or two specific shows, since we spoil literally everything. My name is Kat, and Senku made me some handcrafted antibiotics that have cleared up my strep throat. So I can do even more partying. <laughs> you guys are assholes. <laughs> Weak sauce. Uh, uh, also with me are Leo and Vcom. Yay. Hi, I'm Become. Honestly, though, if if he had made me some antibiotics, I probably would have died because I'm allergic to penicillin. I can only have the more huh. fancy antibiotics. Well, then he can make the other kind, the uh, sulfa drugs or the synthetic drugs. <laughs> the oh, well, but aren't... I think that's still based on penicillin because I think amoxicillin and the rest of them are harder to make. I don't know. If I think sulfa is like completely different. I think it's like... Because I think um, we'll get to it when we talk about Dr. Stone. Okay, because I was confused about that. I was like, what is fucking sulfa? What the fuck is this? I was yeah, like, it's voice. short from some, for some really long word that none of us can pronounce. So. Okay, that's why. I was yep. like, I've never heard of this. I don't know. But I guess we have to look it up and talk about if it is bullshit or not. Guys, I have a live, uh, a live correction right now. Uh, Icy Rose has messaged us on Discord. I see that. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> what? You have to go. Time for some news. Um, so yeah, Icy Rose messaged us about the Gina Zena name. Literally, thing. right now as we record, <laughs> it's, it's hilarious. <laughs> the uh, timing is so perfect. <laughs> in uh, Dumbbell, and so we were like confused because they were calling her Zena, and then they started calling her Gina. And apparently, Gina's name comes from the Russian porn stars Gina Gerson and Crystal Boyd. So her nickname or her name would be Gina, like uh, Gina Boyd. Is where her name comes from, <laughs> which is interesting. <laughs> what an origin story, boys! Uh... <laughs> so you're telling me one of the characters is named after a porn star, a Russian porn star? <laughs> At least one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, the author of Kangan no Ashura, I buy it. <laughs> like, I also like if you actually go read the dumbbell manga, it's barely not porn. So yeah. Anyway, I mean, it's just full on fan service. It's almost softcore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right, we should get into some nonsense. Uh, who wants to start? Ah, uh, hmm. well, if you guys are gonna talk Cat about volunteered. Porn. All right, so I got two. I got two things. First of all, I sold my car finally, my old car, because I got a new car. Thank God, I was tired of it. I was trying to sell it by an owner for the longest time. People are bitches about looking at your car. They'll come look at it, be like, eh, and, and just leave. <laughs> like, they waste your time. Why did you even come look at it if you weren't interested in it? Well, they were like, interested. They just... Well, but, like, they didn't do... It. Like, literally, they'll have you drive over. They'll look at it for five minutes and then just be like, eh, and just like, like, I'm not here for your pleasure. Either you were serious about it or not. I don't know. I get irritated. And so I, I've been dealing with that a lot. Finally, someone bought the damn car at the price I know it was worth. And it was interesting, though, because I, I went to a bank to do the exchange because I was selling it for cash. And, um, you know, we're all sitting in the bank and he's like, my friend's coming with the money. And we had to, like, sit in the bank for 25 minutes. And I was just thinking, Ooh. like, is this a scam? Is this a scam? Is this a scam? <laughs> but then at the same time, I'm like, I mean, what's he going to do? We're in a bank. Like, he can't do shit to me. So, like, I don't need to be worried. Worst case scenario, I sit here for an hour and leave. Yeah, um, nothing worse than that is probably going to happen. Yeah, but I did feel kind of like a drug dealer. <laughs> Why? We're, Why? The, ca the cash, cash is on for, its way. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're oh, okay. waiting here for the cash, and everyone's like all nervous. Like, Let me tell you, drug dealers usually don't like, <laughs> bring their cash to like a bank. <laughs> I'm just saying, you're sitting there waiting for a large amount of cash. Uh -huh. Everyone's nervous and not looking, like avoiding eye contact with each other. 
felt a little shady, even though there's nothing shady about it. Cat, here's the th- question: Did you uh, did you give him the Carfax? I did give him the Carfax. <laughs> I, was, I didn't expect that. <laughs> Uh, oh my god uh, i was I got, ready with that carfax all right i can tell cat has never bought drugs before because that's not <laughs> how it goes down usually the exactly. people usually uh you're pretty chummy with your drug dealer <laughs> yeah no i i don't have to buy drugs people always do that for and, me. and don't ask me but, how i know this stuff uh <laughs> <laughs> research yeah, Leo, how do you know that stuff um but yeah, uh, and then also today my friend had to bring over her hedgehogs because her house was being fumigated. Whoa. And um, yeah, and so I brought them in and like put them in the spare room and Ruby got to check them out and she was just like, holy fuck, what are these? Like, <laughs> oh my God. And she'd like sniff them and it would like bristle and she'd be like, ah, like it, it poked me with its spikes, and it was adorable. Do you have any uh, gold rings that you could uh, set up around the house? I hear they like those. <laughs> I really like collecting yep. those a lot. We did We did um, put them in their little maze in the spare room with like, <laughs> tunnels and stuff. They did have like little um, containers with tunnels back and forth. And it was a little bit um, did mazy. Did your cat have any reaction to them? Oh, he just fucking hit immediately. He's not dealing with that bullshit. You know? <laughs> He's like, there's someone in the house. No, uh, I'm nope, out. Nope, I'm out. <laughs> Smart move. Yep. What about you, Leo? Yeah, Leo, what's okay, up? Okay, so I missed this piece of news from fuck like four weeks ago. If you remember Ikumi Nakamura, like the one of the uh, design artists or leads in like Ghostwire Tokyo, who like made a huge impact at E3 left the studio. And that wow. blows my mind that she left after being such a huge hit at E3. And I guess she's been going around just like visiting other studios. Yeah, I saw tweets from Corey Corey Barlog from Sony Santa Monica who made God of War. Uh like I'll put a, a image in our chat where they were just, like, posing together in, like, the Sony Santa Monica studio. Because, yeah, like, Akumi put up a tweet, like, hey, if anybody wants to work with me, hit me up. Um, yeah, I guess she's, like, really, uh, she posts a lot on Twitter, too. And, like, you really know what she's doing most of the time. And, like 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 I said, they find out she's just going from, like, stu- visiting studios. We're, like, for whatever re- I don't know, looking for another job, I guess. But, and there's absolutely nothing on why she left that the original studio in the first place. Yeah, there's nothing. I I assume be, she blew up at E3. Like she became yeah. like a public, a public, publicly known person. I think she's just like testing the waters now because she's like semi famous in the gaming community now and probably could make mm-hmm. a lot more money somewhere else. Yeah, they um, probably weren't paying her enough, and she's like, "Fuck this, I'm out. I can make more money." That's my biggest guess. Or either that or she wanted like a different challenge or like she thought it was an opportunity to go do something else that she ever she had wanted to be doing and didn't get the chance to. So one or the other. But it's often about the money, too. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, it's all about that money. Yeah. <laughs> uh, speaking of gaming, I played a couple of new games this week. I'll start with the one that I think is really exciting, which is Sayonara Wild Hearts. Uh, you may have heard this. Uh, announced at like the Apple uh, arcade thing in the Apple event like, like a week ago because it was like the game that headlined their new Apple arcade service where you pay like five dollars a month and it grants you access to like I don't know like a hundred games on your mobile phone on or your iPad or your iPhone. Um, so I didn't play it that way because I don't have an iPhone, but I do have a PS4 and I have a Switch and it's on PS4 um, and it is a rhythm game. That is basically a pop album, like a synth pop album that you play through as like a character who's like a a girl who's gone through like a breakup and is trying to like sort of get over it by sorting through some demons. And like it's (laughs) this it's this progression of pop songs Um, and it starts out like it's very simple or simple controls like with a joystick. You're just basically moving your character back and forth at first. But it gets, like, exponentially more interesting as it goes on. Like, especially, like, I think it's the fourth level in the game is the longest one by far of those first four. 
and like you start like battling against like these like other like motorcycle girls um and there's this one really really cool part where one of them like rips apart like the road underneath you and then you just start flying down the canyon beneath the road uh through like rings and stuff that you're trying to collect to get a high score it's so awesome it it's perfectly like matched to the music like everything you do and collect like feels like it belongs as part of the song like so if you're hitting everything right it just feels amazing um it's hard to get everything on like the first run and get like a perfect score or like there's there's three ranks there's bronze silver and gold it's hard to get gold rank on the first run because there's just some stuff that you can't even see coming the first time but and I was kind of annoyed at that as I was going through because I was getting like a lot of silvers and like a few bronzes near the end. And I was like, well, this is kind of unfair. But then when I replay, so once you finish all the levels in the game, which only takes like an hour the first time through, it's not that long. Um, it opens up like an arcade album mode where you can play through all of the missions at once for like a total cumulative score. Or you can just replay all of the missions individually. And just replaying everything to get gold has been so much more fun because uh, you can you figure out all these paths and you feel like you're just like becoming one with the music and it's just awesome. And the whole album is up on Spotify if you want to go listen to it. I'll link it in the uh, Nerdum and Other Nonsense Discord in like the music section. But and what are you playing it on? Uh, PS4, uh, okay. which has been fun. It's it's really good. Is it only on PS4? No, so PS4, Switch, and iPhones and iPads, uh, I believe, at this point, is what it's on. Um, the other thing I played this past weekend was the Call of Duty Modern Warfare beta. Uh, <laughs> I haven't played Call of Duty in, like, five years. Um, <laughs> Jeez. I used to play it a lot back in, like, the Modern Warfare, Modern Warfare 2 days, Black Ops 1. Um, this is like a reboot of the the original Modern Warfare game, sort of slash continuation. Uh, but this this past weekend was just a multiplayer beta, uh, and so I jumped on with some friends who wanted to try it out, and it was kind of nice because we could cross play between PC and Xbox, and I think PS4. Like it was all collective, as long as you connected through like Activision accounts, uh, you could play with people on PC very easily, kind of like how Fortnite does it. Um, God, I could see PC people just shitting on PS4 players. <laughs> so it was interesting. Like, there was some of that, but it wasn't that pronounced to where I felt like I was completely dis- getting destroyed by PC players. Because I was in, yeah, I was in lobbies with, you could see, like, they had, like, a PC and a keyboard. Uh, and then other people had an Xbox and a controller. And there were some people playing with controller on PC as well. Um, and, like, I didn't feel, like, completely overmatched, like, aim-wise by PC people. Mm-hmm. There are a couple times, though, where I was like, all right, I'm just getting killed here. Uh, those people were, were better, probably. It's a beta, so people <laughs> didn't know exactly what they were doing. Um, right. I'll say it feels like Call of Duty, but it feels pretty damn good for a Call of Duty multiplayer game. It feels a lot like those older Modern Warfare games that people love and like the series was built on. Um, and so it was kind of nostalgic going back to it, except like, the graphics are fantastic and the sound design is really, really good of all the guns and all like the footsteps and everything and just like explosions happening on different parts of the map and like the sound like reverberating through the map towards you. Uh, it all felt like really realistic and visceral and good. So I'm kind of interested in that game for the first time in a long time. I might buy a Call of Duty, but we'll see. I'll wait for reviews and see how the campaign and everything else shakes out. But uh, my initial impressions were that it was not bad, uh, though I think the maps could use some work. The, some of the maps were, I don't know, a little annoying. There's bad choke points and head glitch spots that, you know, it's every Call of Duty beta is like that, though. So hopefully mm. they fix that. Yeah, usually with multiplayer maps, you just have to learn the uh, line of sight, sight yeah, line or whatever. I- yeah, once you've figured out the places that you can do well on the map, that changes everything. Um, hmm. Okay. The entire time you guys were talking about that stuff, I just was I was like hearing "Ra Ra Rasputin, lover of the Russian queen." <laughs> You're still thinking about Gina from Dumbbells. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. 
Uh, that's like what happens when uh, Leo watches Given. He just <laughs> zones out. Yeah, I'm actually an episode ahead and uh, just over it. It's not for me. It is just not for me. Oh, you that's just bad don't news. like slow anime. You don't like it when the story unfurls well, slowly. And I think they're just being really whiny. Well, let's well, save it. Let's save it. Feelings, we'll save it. Leo. People need to talk about their feelings. <laughs> well, we don't need to whine about them. Let's save it, though, for the actual <laughs> given section. Let's talk about girls with dumbbells Yay! named after porn stars. Uh, <laughs> at least one of them. <laughs> at least Gina is a girl, apparently. So episode eight, what if we get lost? So Satomi has two fellow teachers at the academy. Our names are Rumiko and Yakusha who are curious as to why she hasn't any time to go out with them lately. And like Satomi leaves behind her why silver are men's gym Why are all the teachers cart. so fucking hot? <laughs> because this they is basically a porno in manga form <laughs> and less so in anime form. Why does the one teacher have no eyes? <laughs> because she's one of those ara, ara ladies who just ara, uh, ara. never opens her eyes. And when she does later in the episode, you see why she doesn't open I, them. I believe she's like former Yakuza or married to like a Yakuza or something like that. Well, she's just like exactly. demon yeah. eyes. <laughs> she's when demon she was eyes, born, yeah. she yeah. opened her yeah. eyes and they were pure black. And everyone was like, fuck no. And just were like, never open eyes. She's like eyes. one of those former Yakuza bosses that <laughs> just becomes a wife, you know? <laughs> <laughs> But she looks like the demons from like Kimetsu no Yaiba. Like it's like pretty yeah. fucked up. A bit. Um, so yeah, the, I feel like in, in the modern age, if you wore kimono constantly, people would comment about that. That would be like someone coming in and wearing exclusively like um, pioneer outfits or something, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Adidas like, track clothes. People don't do that. I mean, people do it for fun, like at festivals, but people don't do that. This is true. Uh... So, yeah, these teachers, they follow Satomi, or they figure out by her card that she left behind that uh, she's been going to Silverman's gym, and they follow her there. Uh, and they're ready to work out. And, yeah, Yakusha was funny to me because she is one of those Ara Ara types. Um, mm-hmm. She also th- subtly threatens to murder Rumiko when she points out that uh, Yakusha is the oldest of the teachers. <laughs> um, she's like, I'm not fucking around, bitches. Yeah. Basically. Uh, once the two teachers notice Machio, though, they're like, oh, Satomi, now we know why you're coming here. Look at this hottie, this hunk of meat. Uh, so Machio asks them if they have any problem spots in their body they want to work on. And Rumiko lifts up her shirt and says, oh, I'm worried about my sides. And then she proceeds to, like, squish what is supposedly the fat on her <laughs> sides. And there's, like, literally nothing there squishing between her fingers. And I'm just like, come on this show is so ridiculous sometimes it is but i will also say sometimes you think you feel fat even when you aren't so yeah i know that but yeah but i do agree sometimes they're like look at this fat bitch <laughs> and you're just like listen listen okay yeah this show's been doing that a little too much i feel like well, but from, yeah from the first yeah. episode i was just like oh okay all right i see what's going on but regardless, Rumiko has been doing sit-ups and seeing no results. And so Machio explains that you have to exercise, like, to train different regions of your abs. And he's like, oh, the abs are divided into four sections. You've got the rectus abdominis muscle, and then you have deeper inside the transverse abdominal. And then on either side, you have the external internal oblique muscles. And so these, like, those, like, run diagonally along the abdomen, whatever, on the sides. And so he says to work those sides, you got to work your obliques, got to do bicycle crunches or side bends with dumbbells. And so the teachers start... I had never heard of those. Oh, the side bends? Oh, side bends? I used to do those uh, in high school for a little bit. I stopped doing them, though. But Bicycle crunches are a fucking bitch, though. I used to do those in swim class. Those are, like, one of the best workouts I've found that, like, really... Hit your abs hard. Ugh. They'd be I like dry land exercises, bicycle bitches. And we're like, no. <laughs> yeah, the thing that I didn't know is that, like, so with the side bends, uh, apparently, like, so you can use a dumbbell to add some extra weight to it. And so, like, you, you like, bend towards the side of that arm that's holding the dumbbell. Um, but if you, apparently if you, like, lift the dumbbell up, like, a, and, like, sort of bend away from it, that's, like, a higher intensity workout. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, and like Yakusha is lifting like a 40 pound dumbbell doing those. <laughs> yes. She has some major like muscle. 
<laughs> and like Satomi's like, do you play a sport? And she finally like opens her demon eyes at this point with the purple pupils, black irises. And it ends the conversation. Um, and like basically that segment ends with the teachers like deciding that they're going to join a different Silverman's gym uh, that's closer to where they commute from, basically. I didn't realize Silverman's was a chain until this episode, but I guess it is. Um, so now it is time for an episode of Encouragement of Climb with Dumbbells because the girls go climb a mountain together uh, like well, that hike. other anime. Or yeah, hike a mountain. Uh, and they're going with the second years from their class and the two teachers are back as well. They're specifically climbing Mount Kuji, which is nicknamed the Mountain of the Dead. And it overlooks a ghost forest. Um, so why would you take a school field trip here? <laughs> Like, why would you do this? Why would you take your students to this mountain? Maybe it's just close. <laughs> <laughs> it was the cheapest one. <laughs> like, nobody else wanted to take their students there. Um, so, yeah, Hibiki, Satomi, and Rumiko are all, like, falling behind because they're having trouble hiking up the mountain. And Akemi comes back and explains to them that they need to pay more attention to how they're walking. Uh, because the mountain is, like, in an incline and the terrain is unstable, you want to use like a different type of stride, a shorter stride. Like I guess Yakusha, like she does like a little hiking tutorial. She's like, walk with your knees slightly bent, straight and tall and uh, stepping with your whole foot at once and taking short steps um, and maintain a steady pace like that. Uh, so you can conserve stamina. And I guess that all makes sense. Um, I haven't done much like mountain hiking. I'd, I'd like to say on even steeper terrain, you'll walk on your toes instead. Yeah, for sure. My mom does like mountain like trails and she's talked about that for sure. So, yep. yeah. Uh, so Yakusha also recommends practicing this by doing step ups at home in front of the TV or something like onto like a pile of books uh, to train your lower body. And this advice like helps the three stragglers out. They all like zoom up the hill, but then they totally miss the sign that directs them to the summit and take a different path and fork in the mm -hmm. road. Uh, and pretty soon they realize they're lost and Hibiki and Rumiko like pull out notebooks and they start like writing their fucking wills down. I liked Hibiki's death poem, which was like, like meat, it went bad. Like meat, it rotted away. My transient <laughs> life, all grease is deceased. Meat enveloped by more meat. <laughs> oh my God. Girls got meat on the mind. <laughs> uh so tell me, get them to snap out of it, tell them they just like they need to work together to survive. And they see a nearby tree and they decide they need to climb it to get like a better view of where they are. Um, and so Tommy goes into this spiel about how climbing trees is good exercise, but it's hard to find a tree to climb in the city. Uh, apparently, because it's like banned in parks to climb trees, which I guess makes sense. It's probably yeah, pretty dangerous. Probably that and probably harms them. Oh, yeah, that know. too. Also, yeah. Um, yeah. so they say an alternative is rope climbing, which you can do, you could find like equipment at certain gyms to climb ropes. I assume you could do this at like the climbing gyms that you go to Leo, right? Like it's, well, I don't know. I mean, you're mostly climbing the rock holes, but I guess you could climb the rope if you really wanted to. Uh, not at mine, but mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, <laughs> we we really have no reason to do it because we have the rock wall there. <laughs> and yeah, that's, that's true. What we yeah. want to train on. This this isn't going to really help <laughs> at all. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to figure out like a situation where you would have this. They, they talk about like this machine that some gyms have called a Viper Rope Climber where you sit and like pull the rope towards yourself and run a seated position. But like I've never seen one of those in real life. Uh, I assume yeah, they exist, but that yeah. one was new to me, too. Um, and yeah, they say it like works your biceps, brachii and your terrace major muscle, which is like sort of like in the back of your shoulder attached to like your scapula bone that like helps with pulling. Um, yeah, your, there's your actually a group of bone. muscles that are referred to as the sits muscles mm -hmm. because they uh, each letter is abbreviation, obviously. So yeah, like what's it? I, terrace. I haven't, yeah. I haven't looked for us like subscapularis and then oh, whatever the fucks are. I don't know. I can only <laughs> remember the first one right now. <laughs> That's more than I can. So good job. Um, so everybody else is just eating barbecue up at like the summit. 
And then they spot the girls with binoculars who are, they have taken off their clothes to try to get a better grip on the tree. And they're trying to like climb it in like their brawn panties. And they're just like, apparently at the athletic corner of the mountain trails is where they ended up. Uh, And that, it just ends on that comedy. And then there's this ominous scene where this butler approaches this enormous dude uh, who has destroyed a, bu- a dumbbell bar with the power of his bare fists. Uh, and he's like, I need to go abroad. I finally found him. And he's talking about Machio, and he's going to go visit Japan to meet him. And so that's weird. We'll, we'll see more about that in future mm-hmm. episodes. Uh, I remember this in the manga. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the after credit scene is just lunges, which makes sense for like mountain climbing, all the leg lower body stuff they were doing. It's another yeah. useful leg exercise. You can do lunges with uh, dumbbells too. Oh yeah. Yeah. If you want to do like a little bit you extra. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Lunges are like one of the best leg exercises you can do. And they're they kind of good. the easiest. If you know how to do them right, you have to be careful. Don't over step. Don't over lean. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You want to keep your upper torso uh, straight the whole time. Don't if you if you're leaning, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> yep. yeah, yeah, abs tight the whole and don't time. Don't you? You don't want to like push your. Uh, you want to bend your knee or your shin wants to be like ninety degrees to the ground typically. Yeah, see, because yeah. I see a lot of people try to do lunges and they're really just like leaning a lot and they're not their form isn't good. But. Oh. oh, that's one of the things about working out. Form is like extremely important <laughs> to avoid yeah. injury. Yeah, yep. I like to watch people at the gym just completely with terrible form and just like, laugh. Because <laughs> they're doing way more damage than they are good for themselves. Yeah, and, and you're just like, oh, okay, so you, you don't know what you're doing at all. Like, I don't know a lot, but like, I'm fine with that, you know? Yeah. But I'll be good. I'm good with what I do now. <laughs> <laughs> That's all I need. I don't need to be ambitious and, and do dumb things. So, Leo, who do you think is the cutest of the three teachers? Uh, the kimono girl. I like this is the this is like this fuck Mary kill situation. <laughs> <laughs> kill oh, that if, demon. You, if you were like, who, who are you going to take back to your place? I'd be like kimono girl for sure. Back uh, to your place. Uh, Yakusha. Probably you have to m- marry Satomi because you know you would get along the best with her because we have similar interests. Mm, okay, so that's who you'd have to marry. Uh, yeah, fuck Akusha and then just kill Rumiko. <laughs> oh, kill Rumiko! Oh, my heart. I like Rumiko a lot. I think she's really cute. I mean, I would still love the fucker, but I have to kill one of them. <laughs> unfortunately. <laughs> oh man. Nothing well, against her. <laughs> uh, enough about those maidens. Let's talk about the other maidens and their savage uh, season. Maidens. <laughs> these bitches. I'm so tired of them. Okay. <laughs> Why? They're young and they do dramatic things. Sometimes. I think it just reminds you too much of your past. <laughs> I don't know about that. This is not at all uh, reminding me of my teenage years at all. We did not do things like this. <laughs> um. <laughs> So yeah, the start of this, they're having their culture festival. The literature club is doing this dramatic reading to try and cement the um, urban legend about the shadow that they came up with. By the way, this is episode eight, though you should know that. Yeah, yeah, they know that. Fucking Beacom, give them credit. (laughs) We usually say which episode it is. (laughs) Well, I did it. I'm breaking the rules. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, But yeah, so... The one where, the, you know, you step on your crush's shadow and then you confess to them and it'll turn out well or whatever. Um, and I love how Azumi's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to come by and watch your thing. And, and Kazu, Kazusa is like, which one, though? Because I have to be emotionally prepared. And Azumi's <laughs> like, ah. And then Kazusa's like, ah. And, like, freaks out. <laughs> and I'm just like, in real life, that would never just just go by the wayside. Because Azumi would be like, what did you mean? <laughs> like, yeah. somehow that just goes by the wayside. Um, that redhead dude comes to get Momo at the culture festival, and she blows him off. She's just like, fuck yeah. at him and walks away. Oh, and as Sator- she le- Sator- yeah, Sat- No, we call Sator- him Chad now, remember? Leo's name's Chad. Chad. I, just, Chad. I just call him the redhead, because he doesn't deserve a <laughs> fucking name. He's just a douche. Um, <sighs> Yeah, Momo's but like, we're not even friends. Well, but you're you're skipping. Good ahead. for Momo. Oh, so, sorry. Yeah. 
so as she's leaving, she hears one of his friends say, like, oh, she's rude. And he's like, she just shy, which like, really pisses her off more. She's like, bitch. But of course, she doesn't say that. Oh, you're right. I did um, skip ahead. Sorry about that. Yeah. yeah. And then Nina splits her time between the class, her class booth and the lit club booth. And she hears, I think they're, are they giving like, like foot massages or something weird? Uh, you know, like, I don't no, remember. they were sitting in like uh, the pools with the, uh, like it's like warm water. Like you can soak your feet in the pools. Oh, okay. That's so weird. But yeah. like, okay. No, that's totally a Japanese thing. 100%. Mm-hmm. Those I mean, are like, I used to out, soak they have my those feet. like. In, out in public, cat. Yeah, foot baths. They have them in public? I, I yeah. mean, I used to soak my feet in hot water when I got home from a 12-hour shift at a restaurant. But, like, I don't think this is quite the same thing. Um, but anyway, so they're doing that. So everyone's got their feet out. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a little weird. And, and anyway, uh, Nina hears some of the girls saying, like, well... We wish she'd just leave and go to the literature club permanently because, like, we're annoyed and being shitty. And she, Nina's just like, what? Whatever the fuck. And just leaves. And Izumi follows her and is like, why did you just ignore them and not say anything? And she's like, well, it's just going to make it harder, which is true. And he asked how that would be. And she says, like, do you really want to know how to make it harder? And then she turns around and, like, touches his face and he blushes. And she's like, fuck. And, like, leaves and goes in the bathroom and flips her shit. And um, Nina's like, oh, I didn't feel anything when I touched the pedo, and I felt something when I touched him. And so she's interested. And later she does the play with Kazusa and Hongo and everyone. Um, And Hongo gets tripped up by the teacher saying, my girl, even though he just means student. Which was Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I think there was like... There's like, it was one of those words that has like a double meaning. Yeah, it could yeah, be multiple like things Japanese. given the in context. Japanese, which yeah. is kind of like when they did it, I was like, all right, I think that's just a translation thing right there <laughs> that kind of seemed off. But yeah. Well, yeah, yeah then, he didn't, he probably didn't mean anything by it. Like she even admits like, oh, he probably just means like my student, like this, this, yeah. this girl. Yeah. But she heard yeah, like it like she, my girl. Yeah. Yeah. Like he, she didn't think he was that. Yeah. It's just yeah. the the double meaning or whatever. And then Kazusa thinks, like, she wants to confess to Izumi tonight, and she's determined. And Nina's, like, watching her, like, being determined. And I'm like, hmm. And um, I thought this was really cute. Rika and the tan girl. The girl oh, yeah. who's, like, uh, they take a break together. Jujo? Jujo. Jujo. Yeah, I looked her name up as Jujo. Yeah, weird name. Jujo. Okay, Jujo. And they talk about how, like, after she had sex with her boyfriend, when they hadn't didn't know each other... They decided they actually liked each other, and now she only lets him touch her chest, which is so shitty. I can't imagine you have sex with someone <laughs> once, then you start dating, and then she's like, sorry, now we can't have sex. I feel you know like... What? I, I think she's my favorite girl, because she seems to kind of have her shit together. <laughs> she's cute. She is cute. Like, she does care about him and everything. But but it is funny. You have to admit. Like, that's an interesting. Yeah. She is, like, very, um, like, self-composed and, like, confident. Yeah. I like that about her as well. Yeah. And um, Rika is surprised about this. And it's like, what? Um, but it was kind of adorable. I liked it. Later on, that red-haired guy comes back to annoy Momo again right before the second performance. And she's like, hey, we're here. And he's like, hey, we're here. Da, da, da. And she's like, we're not even <laughs> friends. And, like glares at him and it's all dramatic and she's like mm. good for and momo good and he gets for this her. weird look and like walks away with his friends and i'm like that's right bitch go <laughs> like fucking bitch <laughs> fucking like, chad <laughs> <laughs> i love how momo, momo is so adorable too she's like i told him i told him and i'm like you did something momo very You're proud of her <laughs> Yeah, and so they do the other, the second performance, and during this one, the the pedo, the pedo is there, which is like really irritates Nina because she's like, oh, right before he sits and like it's... right next to Izumi too, and he knows know. who Izumi is, like he knows that he's like the important guy, and so sits yep. right next to him. What an asshole! <laughs> he is an asshole. And suddenly Nina's like, but I will not rely on this legend, and like walks away, ruining the play. And it's actually weird because she just got finished thinking in her head during the play, like, the the pedo only likes girls because he can't predict what they will do. And, and I want to do something different. I want something different than that. And then she just does something unpredictable. And I'm like, Nina, <laughs> you're doing the exact opposite of what you just said. 
Um, <laughs> and Nito like reaches out into the audience and like touches Izumi. And this pleases Pedo, which is nearby. And <laughs> right is, next to him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. And, and Izumi like takes Nino away and is like, let's talk. And of course everyone's like, ooh. And, <laughs> and Izumi like in the in the back is like, What? What did you like wh- what were you doing? Like, I don't know. And she's like, I don't know what I did that. Da, da, da. And Izuma, Izumi is thinking like, oh, the pedo it, it was there and you just wanted to make him jealous and like I'll help you and and all the while, of course, Nina's like, I like you, you d- dumb asshole. And, and well, she's it, like, and, she's being so nice. He's so nice. He, she's thinking to herself, like, inside her, as he's yeah. saying all this stuff. Like, but, and I, I agree with her. Like, he's being so nice about this. It's ridiculous. He is. <laughs> he is. Um, and, of course, he's like, and this whole thing made me realize something in this dramatic cut, which is We so know exactly what it is. It's we know exactly so what made him realize. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, meanwhile, Kazusa and Momo talk about how Kazusa's mad, but like not at Nina, but herself, because Nina always told Kazusa to face her feelings head on, while she actually liked Izumi too. Yep. And Kazusa feels bad about acting like this was like a real tragedy and wallowing in it and all this. And I, I, like, guess I, I like I, that I reaction. That. That's like a smart, wise reaction. I mean, yeah, there's there's reason to be mad at Nina for doing this, and especially in such a public setting. But like, Kazusa has had every chance. She she can blame herself just as much as she can blame Nina easily. Yeah, and then uh, I love you get you get a um a look at Ju Zhao's bo- like boyfriend. Jiu-Jiu. He's he's <laughs> totally nerdy and like just <laughs> yep. serious looking, and they they look so mismatched. I'm not gonna lie, uh, Erika is even surprised. Um, but you can tell that she really loves him, and it's cute. Mm-hmm. So. Um, and then later at the bonfire, that urban re- legend, like, really does spread fast, and Hongo is, like, flattered by it, um, that her stories, like, influence so many people, but also, like, everyone's like, but, but we don't have details of what, what would happen with it, and she's like, I should have made more details, it was kind of cute. <laughs> I wonder if that was, like, a little bit of, like, Mari Okada as a writer, like, coming through, like, oh, shit, plot holes, damn it, like, when, pe- yeah. when she sees people, like, read her works, or watch her works, and they're like, oh, there are a bunch of plot holes, like, she's probably like, oh, no, she probably <laughs> empathizes. Yeah. And then Hogo thinks she wants to confess to the teacher, but he's with the other cute teacher, and this upsets her. Mm-hmm. Rika goes up to her boyfriend and, like, dramatically, like, not even steps. It's like a squat. <laughs> like, like, it's like a position. sumo stance. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and dramatically steps and, like, apologizes to him and talks about how she's likened relationships to sexual desire and she was really embarrassed about their relationship. But she doesn't care anymore and, like, confesses in front of everyone. And he hugs her. And it's it's really fucking adorable. I love it's, his reaction because he, like, turns around and he, like, whispers to himself, like, how do I react? And then, like, he just flings himself onto her, like, says, holy crap, and, like, hugs her. Um, yeah. Because he's in love with her. Yeah, and he's just I just want to say good for wanted. Rika and Shun finally working things out because yeah. that was cute. God, that it was, was fucking cute. wearing on Shun having to hide this relationship. I know. Well, it was, and I think <laughs> Rika saw him with that girl earlier in the day at the festival and was just like, I need to do something like soon. Or I'm going to lose him, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then Azumi ends up confessing to Kazusa before she does him, which I'm like, girl, like, even in this, you, you didn't even do it first. Um, <laughs> and I guess, like, we know what he realized. It's cute, too, but, like, personally, I thought Rika's was more cute. Me, too. Um, yeah. And then Nina confesses to the pedo, like, oh, this is my first love and first heartbreak, like, later. Um, and then she says she's going to let herself obsess, which sounds bad. And I'm just like, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, so. for sure. Yeah, Izumi's uh, confession was kind of weird because he's like, I see you as an older sister and a younger sister and a close yeah! friend. It was not uh, yeah. great. So there's some still some issues there. I think they need to work through. Yeah. Um, not perfect. Yeah. I don't know. And like, yeah, Nina, everything with that, like, I think Izumi, what he was saying to her, there was some truth in that, in that she is doing things because of Sayagusa, the pedo, like, even if it's not because she wants him to be jealous necessarily, she's doing things because of him, like, urging her not to be, like, a boring girl and stuff. And so she needs to, like, work things out with that. Like, I know she doesn't feel anything for him, 
Uh, but now she's going to, like, let herself obsess over Izumi and, like, potentially try to steal him away from Kazusa. That's interesting. Um, but, yeah. <sighs> I don't think this love triangle is, is over yet. I think there's, there's more that's going to go down here, basically. Yeah. Well, we still need routes for Nina and Mom- Momoko, so. That's true. God, Momoko, yeah. come on. You gotta, Momoko's got to make a move. That's what's got to happen. Yeah. So. And honestly, I could see Nina being bi. Like yeah, 100%. Yeah, yeah, for sure. She's yeah. clearly like confused about how she feels um, and still trying to figure that out. So, yeah. Then we still got the Hitoha and teacher thing, which like I hope she gets over it and then just finds a different love or a passion. And oh, we have issues with Rika saying she's going to be obsessed now. And it's just like, oh shit, where that, where's that going to go? And then, uh, they could still do drama with Kazusa and Izumi, but like I would be totally fine if they just kind of kind of forgot about them and focused on the other four. Mm-hmm. I'd I be pretty happy with that. Yeah. You know what else deals with obsession? Uh, Demon uh, family bonds. Yeah. <laughs> obsessed <Demon> little spider. <laughs> Cat. More more Demon Slayer. <sighs> We're going to do something with her, Become. She's size at Demon Slayer, and it's so fucking good. <laughs> I like it sometimes. I do like this one. It's oh, okay. just like, sometimes I'm like a little annoyed when they, when they do like some of the shallower stuff, but I don't hate it, and I like mm-hmm. it overall. Yeah. Okay. This is for next week, but I kind of dislike the next episode, but we're talking about episode 21 this week, <laughs> okay. which is against uh, Corpse Rules. Core rules, like Army Corps. Core, sorry. Wait, they still call them corpse, don't they? No, they call them core. No, the P is silent. It's a weird French thing. I think it's a French thing originally. Yeah, it is. yeah. That's news to me. Uh, so Ruri was born with a weak body, and it was even a struggle for him to just try to fucking walk. Like he trips over himself, like trying to take three steps, and then eventually Muzin shows up. And turns him into a demon, and obviously that makes him stronger. Unfortunately, he has to eat humans, and after <laughs> he kills one, uh, his father tries to end Rui's life that night, but he's also going to like take his own life at the same time. But then Rui kills him instead, and also his mother, out of rage. What a nice, poor little boy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and he doesn't feel like he shared a bond with his mother and father, so he's like, oh, they must have been like imposters and not really my parents. But then after a bit, he cools down. He remembers his mother's last words, which she says, I'm sorry, I couldn't have given you a stronger body. So obviously she cared. And then he remembers his father saying he was going to kill himself also after he killed Ruri to atone for Ruri killing somebody. And then Ruri suddenly realizes, I must have had a bond with these people if they cared about me that much. And he's like, damn, I was the one that broke it. Yeah. But like, and this is what... My- yeah, my question yeah, is, when did he realize that? Did he just realize that now, or did he know that all along? I feel like he uh, knew it all they, along. They, no, he, he knew it all along. He realized it after he killed them, he, but no, he no. was trying to hide they from They show him. him sitting on, like, the the porch, and his dead parents behind yeah, him. Yeah, like, he realized it right away after yeah, he killed them. Yeah, it was them. very shortly after. Like I said, like, he cooled down a little bit, got over his anger, his father trying to kill him, and then realized the things they said and what they meant. And this is what strives him to create a fake to uh, create a fake family because he was trying to fill this emptiness he feels after killing his parents, who he did have a bond with after he realized it. Yep. Of see. course, he never succeeds. And as he is dying, he is greeted by his mother and father, and they say that they're going with him, even if it's to hell. And then, like he kind of in the scene, he kind of turns back into a human and like runs into his mother's arms and cries and his father like envelops both of them and like that's a whole whole thing I guess become you had something to say about that yeah I just felt it was like kind of like his parents being able to just decide whether they could go to heaven or hell to join him was kind of idealistic way of thinking of the afterlife maybe like you could assume maybe they were both in limbo because of the events at the end of their life but oh uh, yeah that's one way of thinking of it, but I just like I thought that oh that's a quite nice way for Rui to go out, given that he knew all along that he was just killing and murdering people because he was a little shitter, uh. yeah, and trying to create 
those old bonds he had by forcing these people to be play these roles as siblings and parents and like yeah. forcing them to do that is not the way to do it. <laughs> uh, so I hope they have a good time in hell. <laughs> Basically. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so well, you guys are being too harsh with him, though. Like he, I don't know. He's a person. He's a pretty he bad feelings. person. He had feelings. Okay. So yeah. okay, going into that, this is uh, Gyu steps on Rui's robe, and Tanjiro tells him to get off. He says he will not hesitate to kill demons, but he will show respect for the ones who, basically, being turned in, into a demon, made their life even more tragic. Which is, egg, pretty much exactly Rui's case, and. The demons he's killed before, you see that they like they had something in their life and it was kind of fucked up. But then when they turned to a demon, it was supposed to like I mean you you would think it was supposed to fix it, but really it just made everything worse and made them obsess obsess about uh whatever it was. So like be if being turned into a demon made their life worse and like he felt bad for them, so that's I mean that's his big take for him mm -hmm. uh but then you suddenly knows is nezuko and then he remembers when he met them the first time and he's like oh shit it's you guys <laughs> yeah. wow and then that's when suddenly shinobu comes flying out of the woods aiming for nezuko and you blocks the blade and shinobu is just like she's confused as to why he's protecting a demon she's like what are you doing this for <laughs> She's another character who could say ara ara and you'd be like, yep. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's the right voice. <laughs> so Gyu ends up holding Shinobu off while Tanjiro makes a run for it with Nezuko in his arms. And Shinobu knows Gyu is just stalling for time. So she's like, We're not gonna, I'm not going to keep fighting you. So she takes off. But Gyu goes after her and he eventually does catch up to her so she doesn't get away to go after Tanjiro. But then Tanjiro gets ambushed by uh, Kana. Kanano? Yeah, Kanao. Kanao. She So this is the Kanao. girl who has like a butterfly in her hair like Shinobu, but we don't know if they're, how they're related yet. They just, yeah. No. Yeah. Uh, it, actually, she refers to, uh, Shinobu refers to her as her other, I believe. Oh, okay. At is one that how point. she calls yeah. her? Yeah. But she's like, because she's talking to Gyu and she's like, you know, there's still my other, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I, if I had to guess, it's like her daughter. I would guess like sister or something, but yeah, just because of the relative age at least, but yeah. Ooh. Uh, but he gets ambushed by her and he ends up dropping Nezuku who he's like, you got to run, just run away. And <laughs> it's really funny. She runs off and Kanoa goes after her and like, she tries to swing her sword and she just shrinks into like a little chibi form, but her clothes stay big on her. It's like <laughs> really cute and adorable. She's just running away. <laughs> this, I laughed so fucking hard. Cause like, and they played into it too. Like the background, uh, like chanting music, like they were making like little squeaky voice noises, uh, like in the singing and stuff. And it was just like all chibi. And like, it seemed like it was like super Mario or something um. yeah i i showed you the one like little clip where they put in the super mario noises <laughs> where oh, she's like yeah, yeah, yeah. Mario, where she gets shrinks and stuff it's, it's so good <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah no it's great it's so good uh it is interesting that uh kanoa does find it odd that nezuko nezuko is not attacking her at all and is just running from her so she's like this is very odd behavior for a demon uh but then this while, is, it's, it is very odd. Like, yeah. I yeah. doubt it's ever happened before. Yeah, that's why she takes complete notice. Yeah. And then while Gyu holds Shinobu in a headlock, <laughs> Shinobu's just like, oh, you no, know, you don't have to do this. Like, he's just like, this the, is your the last chance. were so weird to me. They're like, just going around like, attention, we're looking for. And I'm just like, what the fuck? <laughs> uh, yeah. So one of the crows arrives, announces that Tanjiro and Nezuko will be brought back to HQ, and like even describes what they're wearing. And the boy with the scar, Harry Potter, he must be brought back. <laughs> oh my gosh. And I'm just like, what the fuck is this? Like, so like this immediately ends all the fighting. Everybody just immediately stops. And then to end the episode, Tondro wakes up and the first thing he sees are the Hashiras. It's like Badasses. we're about to have an intervention, bitches. At least six <laughs> of them. He's, I think he sees six of them, but there's actually a total of nine. Oh, really? Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Next episode, you get introduced to... Shut yeah, up, Leo! Three other, three other more. Up. Yeah, it, it is nine. No, it is nine. Shut your fucking bitch, man! I'm not, I'm not spoiling. There's nine of them. We you spoil see, everything. You see five or six, and then the next episode, they show the, the other three. We don't need to know about next episode! Yeah, 
episode. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It does matter. We also get to meet the master. Week eight. Week eight. So there's nine of them. It's like the Supreme Court, and they're going to decide uh, whether Nezuko should live or die. Oh uh, what do you guys think? Will Nezuko die next episode? No, he'll probably come to some landmark decision or something. Do you? Okay, Ooh. bigger question. Nezuko can shrink to the size of a child. Can she also grow to the size of like a Gundam? Do you think? I would really like that. That would be fun to see her crush people. Was it in the first sandals. episode where she grew bigger? I don't remember. Did it she? It was the first or second. She grew bigger. She I just don't remember she which did. episode oh, it was. Oh, okay, okay. It was. I think it was yeah. the first one. Yeah. Okay. So she can get bigger. Okay. How much bigger? That's the question. I don't know if you want to talk about you mysteries. You have weird, like, crushing fantasies no, no, to be gone. Is that what, what I'm hearing? <laughs> I just think it would be really funny. <laughs> just like Tondra sitting, just wants a t- sitting on, like, Nezuko's shoulder as she, like, runs through a forest. Like, <laughs> great. I want to see that. Oh, my God. Anyways, talking about mysteries, <laughs> we can talk about Astro Lost in Space. Episode 8, Lost and Found. Oh, yeah. So the girl in the hibernation pod wakes up and thinks she is finally being saved and can finally go back to Earth. We know her heart's going to be broken shortly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they get back to their ship and she tells them she is an astronaut and her name is Polina Livinskaya. What <laughs> nationality is this? <laughs> uh, I think she's supposed to be Polish, but I'm not positive. Don't, I might be wrong about that. But yeah, Eastern European at least. Yeah. So. Okay. Her story is that they needed to make an emergency landing and also got attacked by plants, uh, basically in the exact same way. And her other crew members went outside to, I guess, either try to find supplies or whatever, and they just never returned. So she's like, all right, I'm going to decide to enter this cryopod and take my chances that eventually get found. Uh, And then at one point, she gets asked what her mission was, and she doesn't, she's like, I don't, I don't remember my memory is still coming back, but it takes her a minute, and she does remember. And her mission was to find planets that might be suitable for humans to live on. I'm not entirely sure if she completely divulged what her mission was, or if she's actually intentionally holding it back. What do you guys think? You think she's hiding something? I Who, think she's Paulina? hiding something. Yeah. Everyone's yeah. hiding something in this goddamn anime. Also, I looked it up. <laughs> Apparently, she's a Russian astronaut. My bad. Now you're making me think Rasputin again. What are you doing? God, so she'd be Polina Livinskaya. It's time for Russian girls. <laughs> Polina uh, Actually, I'll ask my Russian friend how you're supposed to pronounce that, and we'll get it perfect next Ooh, time. No, no, no. Okay. Only if you'll come on and in a Russian accent, say her name. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, I'll... Yeah, get him to like record just that, and we'll put like, it in the podcast. It would be over Xbox Live, so I would have to try to figure that one out. <laughs> Uh, uh, she also asked if their mission two is similar to hers since they have the, uh, a, a very similar ship also. And this leads to them, to them breaking the news to her that they are also stranded and can't get back home. She basically faints from this cause she thought she was being saved and really she wasn't, she was still stranded. Uh, and then Ares uses, uses, uh, I guess for lack of a better term, space fruit <laughs> as an analogy to suggest uh, they take the good parts from the Polina ship and put it on theirs. Apparently, ships can be divided into like three sections and be fit together like fucking Legos or something. I was <laughs> laughing that Ares came up with this idea when Zach is sitting there with his like 200 IQ and he's like, I never thought of this. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Like the moment <laughs> Zach saw the other ship, I felt like he should have just like immediately went to this conclusion. Yeah. Like, that's kind of oh, funny. let's see what's damaged on this one. See if we can use the parts. <laughs> like, I think that's, like, just very basic, you know? <laughs> uh, and then the infirmary, just to add more mysteries to the show, Polina freaks when Unaha tells her she's been asleep for 12 years, and it's year 2063, and she goes crazy, and she, sh- and she keeps saying, and nothing happened? Wh- what? Mm, what yeah. is she talking about? Was something supposed to happen? Was, is she talking <laughs> yeah. about being saved? Or, like, was, like, some crazy political thing supposed to go down on Earth? I have no fucking idea what she's talking about. That's yeah. what I assume. And, and then they, yeah. and that's how I know she's hiding something. Because then she doesn't talk yeah. about that like, ever I was, again. I was questionable earlier, but after seeing that, I'm like, oh, she's definitely hiding something. Like, I don't think her mission was exactly what she said it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah. So the, they then go in search of food. And some of the plants move. And to capture them, you have to, like, throw a blanket over them. 
and that stops the movie because then their photosynthesis has been blocked. <laughs> but Kiderae uh, almost it, still gets uh, attacked by some tentacles. Kiderae is hilariously not doing a good job with this. She's just like screaming as she blows throws the blanket at the, like this plant running at her. <laughs> so <laughs> Zach arrives with like refreshments and tells her, you know, go after these ones that actually really don't move and just collect those. <laughs> They end up talking about a couple things. We find out Zach's dad has been researching memory transplanting. Memory transplants. Oh, God. Now, like, this opens up a whole other fucking can of worms. Like, what the hell is this? It does, bad. <laughs> like, who, like, this, like, for now, we're, we're trying to figure out who the traitor is. Now, the traitor could have, like, a memory that's not their own and, like, just be completely. Not even fucked. remember that they're the traitor. Yeah. That's, that's oh, what I God. think. They're just, like, they, they hear, like, a song. Like, that's like, not, that's they, not where yeah, my they get brain hypnotized. went. Oh, yeah. And then that's when they do it. That's what I thought too. I was Ooh, like, "Ooh, that's not yeah. even where my track, my, oh, my thought process went." <laughs> so I, I, I attack it on at the end because okay. of something else that happens. Cool. Uh, but also, his father has apparently gotten really close, but hit a big hurdle towards the end. <laughs> and it turns out Zach also remembers being a kid and giving his dad a drawing of him and how he just looked at him like he was some lifeless doll. Weird. I want to be specific about that. Zach also wants to study space when he gets back and fly for Kanata. So that's kind of cool. Like him and Kanata have like made a pact. Um, Cause Kanata is like going to get a ship or something. And he wants Zach to be his pilot. Uh, Kute also wants to follow her true dreams. And after being flustered enough by Zach says she wants to be his wife. He's like, yeah, we already promised this. <laughs> and he's referring to like when they were children and they made that promise. And she was like, no you're going to, be my husband dream He's like, right. should be that there was someone specifics why <laughs> this is not surprising coming from cat <laughs> this is <laughs> bullshit bullshit okay <laughs> I also thought I was kind of annoyed when she's like, my dream is to be with you. I was like, oh, God damn it. <laughs> Come on. Oh, uh, before they leave, Paulina requests that they try to figure out what happened to her crew and heads towards the location they were going. They finally demolished a rover and it's like flipped over and it's just like in this open field and they're just like, what the hell happened? This, there's nothing here. And then they also find a dog tag. And they start looking around for the other ones when suddenly, like, these plants come spearing out of the ground. And they have tentacle arms and they attack them and it's blah, blah, blah. And Paulina knows, like, another dog tag on top of these one of these plants. And Kanata's like, oh, get it. And because he was trained as a DECA athlete, <laughs> hmm, why was he specifically brought up that way? He basically pole vaults up to the top and gets the dog tags. And it was the most beautiful pole vault in anime I've seen since uh, AG did it in <laughs> Banana Fish. Let's <laughs> get over that wall. Do you guys remember that episode? Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was, was early. A good one. And they're yeah, like, oh my god, show. he's so gorgeous. Look at him. That <laughs> yep. was still better, though. That one was still better. <laughs> that was a good pole vault. Yeah. So yeah, he gets them. Everybody's safe and sound. They go back to the ship, and Kanata suggests they have a party for finalizing, finally escaping the plant. Kirito brings up a topic about the blood they all donated to Polina. Turns out her and Funichia have exactly the same blood type. And you see blood type, and then we think of the couple blood types we know of. And she's like, no, 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 there's way more to it. There's all these other factors to them. And she's like, hers and mine are like so exact. It's crazy. Hmm. Hmm. And like Polina thinks that's not weird since, yeah, so yeah, we'll get to that. Polina thinks that's not weird since they're... She's like, oh, you're both sisters. That's not weird. And then they're like, oh, they're not sisters. And then they like explain this, the situation to her. She's not sisters. And like, you just get this bunch of shots of two of them like side by side. And like, just as you stare at it, you're like, they're the same fucking person. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Skin color, eye color, hair color. Just like, even though one's way younger than the other, other they're, you're like, the proportions look right. And so Zach proposes they use the ship computers to compare their DNA. Do you have something to say? Well, I mean, he doesn't say that then, but yeah, I've always thought they look really fucking similar. I was like, mm, yeah, yeah, I always thought that from day one also. Mm -hmm. So that night, Zach gets the real results and tells Kanata first. And he's like, the two are an exact match. So it makes you think, so Funi is the clone? <laughs> Attack of the clones, baby. So, General so, Grievous is coming in. <laughs> you guys thought they were implanting ideas into people's minds? But my theory is that, is that some of the parents are making ideal versions of themselves so they can transplant their own memories into them 
and basically live forever. That so way. like the no. plot of the movie Get Out, where like old people <laughs> put their minds into the bodies of like young, healthy people. Yeah, I haven't people. seen it, but I heard that. Yep. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> and I don't think it's all the parents, but some of the parents. So like the doctor parent makes sense. She has two clones maybe of herself for all we fucking know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Then you have Kanata's father who trained his son to be a DECA athlete. So he'd have like a super strong body to be in. And then you have Zach's father who looks at his son like a fucking doll. Like I'm going to live inside you one day. Yep. You know? (gasps) Yeah. So that's, so uh, yeah, that's where my, thought process when I heard all that. But I then like, I remember last episode oh, we were talking about how Aerie's uh, mother is really nice to her for some reason. So maybe, That's why yeah. she's a spy. Because yeah. she's the only one that's not like that. Hmm. Yeah, and also uh, who, Ch- was it Charces? Charces' Char- mother Charse, was the yeah. only other one that cared. But those two have a connection so maybe they were just there to be killed off for some reason like Mm -hmm. i think there's more than one level and then also there's yunaha it's like what's her mother's motivation well her mother is a singer right and then i don't that that means she could she could want her daughter to uh to be transplanted too but she didn't she but she didn't want her daughter to like sing in public well but maybe she regrets her her whole um career because she could be Badly, yeah. I or, swear, or, if, or if her daughter up, gets uh, famous separate from her, then she couldn't use that body as easily. Maybe that makes sense too. Yeah. Fuck clones. We just need one of the parents to be like, "Oh, and they work in the cloning market." And it's like, God <laughs> damn it. <laughs> 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 uh, oh, okay. So one thing, since we pointed out the Aries Sarah thing last episode, uh, if you watch the OP. Uh, when they list all the characters' names, like next to like their character model, Sarah or Ares' name is upside down and spun backwards, so it says Sarah. I don't, I don't know if it's been like that the entire show, but it is now at least. Oh, you need to go back to episode one and see if it's yeah. Changed. I got to check episode one op and see if it was there the whole time. If they've just been fucking with us, because it's pretty funny if they have. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but anyway, all right, we ready to take a break. Yep, stay yeah. good. All right, we'll be back with the second See half. You See you soon. The Trash Pandas bring you this nugget from another trash can. What happens when Brains and Bullets discuss episode two of One Punch Man? Pretty much gene splicing <laughs> heads. They will oh, sp- yep, 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 yep. Yeah, they will splice genes. They have a, a cyborg gorilla. They have a <laughs> frog that walks on two legs and communicates at long range. Like they got, you think it? They splice. The Lion King. Yeah, they they have the lion. They have a f-ing lion, the beast Simba. king, and <laughs> Simba. Yeah, he's f-ing Simba. I don't mean he's f-ing Simba. I mean he's f-ing Simba. We at Trash Pandas Watch Anime dig through the trash so you don't have to. You can find the Trash Pandas Watch Anime podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter where we'll get live updates from what we do. Hey. Hey. Do you like wrestling? Whether it be in a bar, an arena, some weird place in Asia, or in a stadium. Or the occasional penis plex. Well, if any of these things might tickle your fancy, anywhere in between from penises to wrestling, you can come and check out our podcast. Our podcast name is Smack It Down. We talk all things WWE, New Japan, anything else in between. I'm Jay Silver. I'm Corey Gold. And we look forward to you joining us. Happy Rusev Day. Happy Rusev Day, indeed. And we're back. And we've got Dr. Stone. Everyone, get hype. I love the show. All right. Like the show so much. Stone Road. Um, So the villagers are all talking about this foreigner that's at the edge of their village or whatever. (laughs) Um, They're like, oh, I don't know. As long as he stays out there, like, I guess he can do whatever the fuck. I think it's funny that they're like, well, yeah. Um, Which is weird because they live on like a tiny island. So, like, what are you gonna do when your community grows and you need to expand? <laughs> <laughs> well, That's a good also, point. like, would they be a little curious? I don't know. It's weird. Well, they they previously like banished someone to outside of the village, and they're like, "Is it that guy coming back or something?" But no. oh, yeah. I didn't catch that part. I did catch like Kohaku's dad disowned her, so he's like, "I disowned her." And he like <laughs> takes his cup in his 
hand. He just like smashes it. And I'm like, listen, bitch. <laughs> that cup did nothing to you and you're a dick. Have you, have you ever seen someone smash a cup with their hand? They hurt their hand. It's a stupid <laughs> thing to do. <laughs> It Unless you're a thing. badass cat, come on, Jesus! Mm-hmm. So what I've learned from this is Kohaku's dad is a fucking stupid bitch. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I missed the disowning part. That's interesting. No, I remember yeah. that. Yeah, he he's like, I already disowned her. What else? And she's still doing but stuff like, like this. Yeah. So of course, of course, we'll have to figure out why what happened there because obviously mm-hmm. something happened. Right. Um. But anyway, Kohaku and the other guy, I think his name's Chrome. Yeah, his name's Chrome. Chrome. Um, try to help Senku make the medicine for like Rui. the browser. <laughs> yes, <laughs> like shiny and Chrome. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they're trying to make this medicine for Rui. Um, and I love how Chrome and Kohaku are on the side, and they're like, "He's planning to save Rui as some part of some sleazy scheme." And I'm like, "I don't know if it's a sleazy scheme. I mean, he's really <laughs> just like, all right, I need support from the village." Um. And then Senku wants to make this antibiotic. So I guess that I guess it would cure most stuff, but like not everything. And this is how you get bugs that are uh anti antibiotic. <laughs> well, I mean, not in this situation. Cause this is how it starts. <laughs> become super bugs. Uh huh. All I know is I'm sickly by nature, and if I get sick, I demand an antibiotic. I get it ahead of all of everyone else. Like, tough oh, shit. you're part of the problem, cat. Tough God damn shit. it. <laughs> I have asthma. I deserve it. Give me the fucking antibiotic. Don't tell me I have to go home and suffer. I don't want to hear it. Oh no. My God. Oh Give me the God. goddamn antibiotics. Oh. I don't want to hear about how I may have a virus and it may not work. You know what? I take it and it works. So it's a lie. <laughs> You're just telling me that because you don't want to give it to me. They're just trying to save the world, Kat. And I don't you're just care. Like, Fuck I want to save world. myself, okay? <laughs> wow. You, you, you see, I'm I'm pretty naturally immune to just about damn near everything. I'm, I'm pretty pretty healthy. Like, nothing really makes me sick. So, like, I'm hearing all about these super bugs and, like, the antibiotics making them uh, even stronger. And I'm like, damn, that's one of the things that's going to finally fucking end me because when I, the one time I need an antibiotic, it doesn't fucking work because of people like cat. <laughs> Listen, I get sick, okay? I get really sick. Stop getting sick. Stop partying all Stop. every fucking weekend. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Oh my god. <laughs> Gotta give uh, Rumi an antibiotic, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's, what's really funny is I saw Kat put something on Facebook today where it's like pet owners at 3M and she, it shows a person sitting up in bed and she's like, who's chewing plastic? It, it's true! <laughs> That's exactly what it's no, like! No, I woke up in the middle of the night like, what the fuck are the cats doing in the other room? <laughs> I know, and you're just like, what are you doing? It, like, like, you say it out loud, like they're gonna come in and tell and you. And it stops you know they're suddenly, because they're like, shit. <laughs> And then, it, and then it starts again after a minute, and you're like, fuck. And then you have to get out of bed and figure out what they've done. Sometimes you come out, and there's like a mess, and you're just like, fuck my life. Oh, pets are a pain sometimes. Sometimes, but they're lovable. Especially my the pets, because I have a fucking husky. You have a, a husky, yeah. That's 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 <laughs> on you. That one's 100% on you. Huskies are just like... Uh, between the hair and the... They're fucking Houdinis of the dog world. They're <laughs> awful. It's like living with the devil. I, sometimes I'll come out and she's like, look what I've done. <laughs> and I'm just like, what? That <laughs> stupid face the that Husky's big. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but anyway, we got sidetracked there. Uh-huh. Um, so <laughs> Senko, Senku says he knows of two ways to make this antibiotic. One out of living creatures and one out of the stone world way out of sulfa, which I've never heard of an antibiotic that's made of sulfa. So okay. sulfa drugs, are, it's short for sulfan, sulfonamides. I can't even say it. Sulfonamides, which are like synthetic man-made medicines. Uh, but that isn't are, that an antibiotic? Is it it, they are also Man-made antibiotics medicine? or like antimicrobial drugs, but they are not related to like penicillin, uh, which I, I think wasn't is the, the other first, type. Wasn't the first was penicillin and was discovered as mold on a 
cantaloupe right and that's like what senku says like oh we could find some like super mold but it would be really hard and that that's like the finding a uh antibiotic from a living organism plan that he says is it would work but it would take too long it's too risky so he wants to go from like making antibiotics from like synthetic materials plan which will definitely work he just has to find all the materials which can be difficult Hmm. okay so that's what that's about. Yeah. So on this map, like he makes this map. Where he's <laughs> like, these are the things we have to do. And I like tried to follow it. But it was really complicated. Like, it was it's, very like, complicated. It's yeah. like iron. And then it's like electricity. And then it's like phosphorus. And then he has like alcohol and vinegar. And then carbonic acid. And then somehow... Like Your, urine was on chemicals. there somewhere. I saw some urine. Yeah, and there's like wow. three chemicals are made out of all of these things. Um, and mm -hmm. then I guess they combine all those. And I'm just like, this seems like some bullshit that's not going to happen. But okay. Um, and then later, Senku explains that the world revolves around the sun. And he realizes, like, suddenly, because he's, he's telling them, like, this is the North Star. And it's like, true north. It's exactly north. And it's really useful. And then he suddenly realizes, like, it's been so many thousands of years that the North Star is not true north anymore because the Earth's axis is, like, tilted slightly. Yeah, that was pretty cool. Because, like, he's like, I can't think as well on this, like, crazy uh, length of time. Like, this crazy spectrum. Yeah. Um, uh, but I was also laughing because Kohaku's like, oh, if, the, if, we, if we revolve around the sun and we're moving constantly, why am I not just flying off of this tree? And he's just like, <laughs> oh, he's on the, he's like added up to here with them. He's like, because gravity, you stupid bitch. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is something you would ask. You yeah, no, it is. never thought about that. <laughs> uh. The flat earthers are like, oh, no, yeah, she's making a good point. <laughs> <laughs> the flat earthers who listen to our podcast are like you're part of the conspiracy oh, oh they, they unsubscribed long ago it's okay <laughs> uh, yeah. but yeah, apparently Chrome has a magnet and he's like you've never seen this and of course Senku's like yes I fucking have and, and this helps them get iron like iron but iron sand mm -hmm. yep um, and then at this so they're searching through this river for iron sand and then at this point, this weird fucking kid with this melon on her head comes up and is like, I'm Melon Head Sika! <laughs> Look at me! And I'm just, I don't understand this. I guess eventually they're going to explain why the fuck she has this melon on her head. I doubt it. I think uh, they'll they explain better, it. They better, they better fucking explain it because <laughs> it makes no sense. And they, and she even I says like, I have to have it on my head and I can't make myself useful to anyone and it's not going to change well if you know it's impeding your life and you know people don't like it then take it the fuck off your head or you better tell me why it's on your goddamn head <laughs> well, you or know otherwise what? I'm going to be pissed off at you as a character they, they explain the, the gorillas <laughs> but I don't think they're going to explain the melon head girl <laughs> I, and I, I don't so. care that she's like what, like five, like six, seven years old. That that matters shit to me. <laughs> if they don't tell me why the fuck this bitch has a melon on her head, I'm gonna be pissed. But cat, she's so cute though. No, it's not cute. <laughs> she's it's so not cute. cute though. But she has a when the little leaves spin around on, on the top head. of her fucking watermelon. It's oh, not. It's so it's cute. It's not. It's disturbing. Imagine if a child came to you and it had a melon on its head. It wouldn't be fucking cute, okay? If a child came to me and had a melon on its head and then somehow made its whole body fit inside of the melon like Nezuko and then rolled away, like I would be very impressed. It, you couldn't see her face. It's like a circus to know that performance. Nezuko was cute. It would just be a creepy headless body with a melon on top of it rolling away. It's I mean, I would be entertained. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> it's a free circus performance, in my opinion. I would have questions, uh, but I would be entertained. No, I would be creeped the fuck out. I'd be like, "This is this is like." I a would assume movie? she was a, a a contortionist and can just like do those crazy moves, put her fucking feet behind her head. I'd be like, "I'm out. getting the fuck out of here." Is what I'd be doing. <laughs> I don't know what you guys are thinking. I don't know, but. The I'm just saying, you guys, I noticed in your comments, you're like, she's so cute. And I'm like, you guys are fucking nuts. She's not <laughs> that, cute. She's no, weird. That's BCOM's comments. That's not mine. Yeah, 
<laughs> shrinking okay. girls in the new anime trend. Everybody get in on the shrinking girls no, trend. No, don't. Don't get in on the fucking trend. I don't know. And it, apparently you find out that they all know the story of Mom Mataro from Brewery. She knows lots of stories, I guess. And so I guess that's her talent is she knows things. Um. And they do explain the whole gorilla thing, like Leo said. Like, I Yay! Guess I was so they know from the fucking story. hyped when they Dude, explained the gorilla thing. I saw that. I was like, thing. B-Com's going to be so fucking happy. Because that was, <laughs> that was like his biggest complaint of the show. How does she know about fucking gorillas? How does she they, know? And then they explained it. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> and it was funny because like, the, the story of Momotaro like, doesn't even have gorillas in it. But they, I guess Ruri added gorillas to make it easier enough for them to understand. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> okay. And they try to make uh, iron out of the sand that they got, and and they guess you have to add coal. And it takes a shit ton of manpower, like to make the fire hot enough. And they're just working and working and working forever. Um, and meanwhile, Ginra wants the spear, so he like goes to help them. And Siku's like, "Hey, hey, like we can win more people over with science," and he's excited. Um. So they send the dumbass melon bitch out, and, and they're like, listen, melon bitch, tell us what people say. She's and a scout. She, she goes out and is like, people want food and sexy men, but mostly food. <laughs> and some, sometimes both at the same time. Yeah. I really want to rewrite the intro so Kat talks about how she likes to wear melons on her head. <laughs> <laughs> Next week. <laughs> Never. Oh, actually, it'll be t- t- three weeks from now. No, it yeah. won't be three weeks. You won't get it to do it. Fuck you. It's too late. We'll forget uh, by then. <laughs> no, 10, 11, 12. No, that'll be the episode. Oh, shit. Yeah, it'll be the finale. Eight. Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, 19, no, it'll be episode 11. No, oh. 12. Yeah, 12. No, 12. 12. 12. We can count. Yeah, 12. You can't count. I, oh, my, my God. Math you skills, can't count. My math skills fucking suck. To, so, yeah, just putting that out there. <laughs> uh, but anyway, so Senku's like, all right, I guess we're making food. So he looks around. He sees this mellet, um, dogtail mellet thing, plant. Well, like, well, the I girl the make. girl calls it dog tail because there's like a dog there, but apparently it's like actually fox tail millet or whatever. It's like it's like what we call, I think, similar to cat tail, cat's tail type thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then he's like, we could use that to make flour, and so he makes a primitive flour out of it, and then noodles. Um, and he makes ramen with it, which there's a big jump from noodles to ramen. Let me <laughs> tell you. It's not, as someone who made ramen in a ramen restaurant as the main chef, it's not just noodles. That's not, <laughs> like, how did he get the broth? How did he get all the shit? Like, that's not, no. But, okay, whatever, Senku. <laughs> um, so he makes the ramen, and Senku realizes, like, oh, this is actually not that good, because, like, the flour is not very tasty. It's kind of bitter. And so yeah. the noodles are bitter. Um, but it's so much better than what these people usually eat. It's like heaven to them. <laughs> yeah. 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 They've never experienced this before. <laughs> yeah, which is interesting. Um, he makes a ramen cart outside the village, and people are like, oh, my God, the smell. And they, like, come. So <laughs> it seems like it'll turn out well for him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that, that was that was a really fun episode. There was like so much science stuff in it, as well as just like the. I like how they ran into the trouble of like, oh, there's so many steps that we can't just we can't just do all this. We need more manpower, uh, so we need to like take this side detour and make ramen for people. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to get them in. Yeah, it's pretty fun. I, I I'm really enjoying this show right now. Like this one was like a really good balance of like teaching us the weird science of like primitive technology. With just like fun shenanigans and watermelon girls, which makes yeah. everything better, obviously. No, yeah, and no spoilers, but this really blossoms in the next episode, which I have not seen, so it I'm is, excited. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, stay excited. You're not going to be let down. It's great, cool. But it's time to take a nap. Yo, you're <laughs> everybody, such a or Beacon will put in a timestamp in the description so you can skip giving. <laughs> You know he won't. Wow. Aggressive. Listen, you're all gonna listen to me talk about this fucking anime whether you like it or not. 
Well, Sit your like, asses down. I mean, I, w- I oh, will put a time stamp. Literally, there will be a time stamp, so you know where to skip. You can decide what to do, listeners. You're going to delete it today, Vcom, just because of Leo's comments. There's one podcast. Fuck there's that. no given time stamp. It's just <laughs> Dr. Stone gets talked about for 25 minutes, and then we yes. start Vimlin Saga. Yes. So anyway, episode eight, time is running out. That... <laughs> The- <laughs> Why does that make you laugh so much? You're such an asshole. I hope you burn. I because hope I one feel day- like time is running out for me every time I listen to this <laughs> One day in your sleep, your house will catch on fire, Leo. That's all I'm saying. Mm-hmm. That's Oof. not bad. I can get out pretty easily. <laughs> <laughs> not if you're asleep. Oh my I'll God. wake up. <laughs> I'm, I'm not threatening this. I'm just fucking around. FBI. I have smoke alarms She's for a serious. fucking reason. <laughs> All right. Anyway, so I can't... Like, we learned his name later on in the episode, and I feel like they said it once, but the blonde oh, Yuki? guy... Yuki? Y- oh, wait, which, Yuki? which blonde guy, though? The blonde guy Who's that, the friend? Um, or yeah, the, the dead friend. guy? Okay. The, the dead guy. The, dead, or the dead guy is Yuki. The blonde friend is Hiragi. Hiragi, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so his name is Aragi. He comes to find um, Mafuyu. He wants to see if he's at work. And she's like, the, the his coworker is like, no, he's not at work today. You should ask him when he works so that you don't have to ask me, bitch. <laughs> yeah. um, and he's like, well, but I can't ask him because Mafuyu hates me. And like leaves. Um and Sato is dropped off by Akihiko after their talk, and Mafuyu goes out thinking about what Haruki said. So they're both just very distracted by the talks they each had in the last episode. And you can tell they're just really thinking about it hard. Like, think, 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 think. Mm-hmm. Um, and Ritsuka even goes up to Sato one day and, like, has to kind of, like, he just stands there for a minute. <laughs> and Mafuyu's just, like, staring, and Ritsuka's, like, kind of looking at him. But also kind of, and then eventually has to smack him lightly to get his attention, even though they're right next to each other. Um, they don't really say much even then. Like it's clear they don't have a lot to say to each other right now. They're really kind of developing independently. Um, and the Akihiko one day makes breakfast, and the roommate gets up and eats well and is fed by Akihiko like by hand, which is weird. Um. That was kind of weird. It crawls yeah, out of bed. It's like, a- give me a bite of that bacon. <laughs> Gatsu and Akihiko have a weird relationship. It's a weird thing going on there, yeah. Yeah, like Akihiko asks if he wants to, if Ugetsu wants to come to the live. Um, and Ugetsu's like, well, but do you suck still? And Akihiko kind of makes a face. And so Ugetsu's like, well, I'm not coming then. <laughs> um. Akihiko's like, but I, you should go. Like, it's it's all I have going for me right now, and I really have worked hard on this, and I think I've done well, and I think I'm good. Um, and Ugetsu says this really shitty thing where he's like, there's no use going to a performance where the musicians aren't even trying. And yeah. this really irritates Akihiko. And he, I don't know, it, it just seems odd for him to be so sh- so critical and shitty um, of it. But then later, ask him, like who gets who asks Akihiko to play violin with him, which is especially after that very odd to ask him, because mm-hmm. we all know that Akihiko is not nearly as good as Ugetsu at the violin, so and quit because of him, yeah, yeah, um, and of course, uh, it's, I thought this was interesting. Akihiko's like, well, you should play with your new boyfriend. Um, viola boyfriend <laughs> yeah and there's a lot of hurt and tension obviously there since they're exes um and he replies like well i just like his face and then they do play violin later so it's there's something there's some little weird tension i, I don't know how y- you can live with your ex yeah it's not a good place to be <laughs> you gotta and, get like, out of intentionally there. while you date someone that would don't do that <laughs> that a- just is that's toxic <laughs> That's if it can really be avoided toxic. at all, just get the hell out of there. Yeah, yeah, because they're doing it intentionally. Like they're not just like, oh, we can't get out right now. We're looking for places or whatever. Like they seem to be doing this pretty intentionally. That's a terrible idea. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, Sato gets texted by um, Hi- Hiragi. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna remember this. 
I love how you like this show so much, but you don't know anybody's fucking names. Okay, oh. their names are hard. They do okay. have really weird names. Like, who the fuck? Mafuyu? <laughs> like. Their names are hard. They're not easy anime names. Okay. This is true. Oh. Um, he gets texted by Hiragi because he wants to see him. And, he like, takes, he like, calls him? Like, yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was going to say, like, yeah, he calls him. And then he, like... Mafuyu like stares at the window, out the window, making direct eye contact with Haragi for like I would say like twenty seconds before he picks up the phone. Yep. <laughs> like he like, really Do doesn't I want to pick to? up that phone. He's like, yeah. "Do I really want to talk to you, bitch? No, but you're still calling me." He calls him like six times or something. Mm-hmm. Um, and Sato kind of asks, Sato and Mafuyu are the same person, just for people who are, might be a little confused. Yeah. Um, Sato asks him why he bothers now when he just stood on the sidelines the whole time everything was happening. Um, and, you know, I guess Hiraki doesn't really have much of an answer for that. Um, Sato is obviously really pissed off at Hiraki. Um, and when, like, he kind of vents a little to him. And when Hiraki's like, I get how you feel. Sato kind of yells and is like, you don't, and then seems surprised at himself that he yelled. Um, yeah, well, he doesn't usually do that, yeah. Yeah, and then Sato just thinks to himself that Hiragi just wants to be forgiven, and it doesn't matter by who. Um, and we get this flashback of this little kid ringing the doorbell labeled Sato, and he runs next door to the Yoshida house. So we find out that Mafuyu, um, Yuki, who's the Mafuyu's boyfriend who died, and Haragi were all really close childhood friends. And then later, she, Shisumi became friends with all of them, too. So there were four friends. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess Yuki and Mafuyu were both latchkey kids, so they were very close. Um, and they, but they had very different personalities. But they all, and then they all ended up going to different high schools. And the three of them, except Mafuyu, started to be in a band together. And I, wa- I wonder if that's what caused the strife. Because they, they're still pretty vague about why they were having fights. But apparently... Well, Yuki Mafuyu and, felt like an outsider, yeah. Because the yeah. three of the others were in a band and he wasn't. And he felt left out. And that can feel weird, yeah. And, and Yuki and Mafuyu had this like silly fight. Wasn't even over anything big. And then two days later, Yuki drank a lot. And I guess OD'd and Mafuyu found him. Which, it's... It's really hard to drink that much intentionally to OD. I don't think unless you, you can drink really a lot commit- of like liquor really fast. But there were like a lot of beer cans, and I was like drinking beer to OD. That's hard. <laughs> like, I don't think he committed suicide I, at all. I because it, it's kind of vague if he did or didn't, and like some people what, were saying he did. What do you mean by OD or alcohol poisoning? So I mean you can you can vomit and choke. That's the most common way people die by alcohol like poisoning is they'll vomit and that, then choke my, on it. That's that's what I mean. So you said uh he OD'd on alcohol, but like your body will reject it and start puking before well, you but can we don't actually know, cause it, OD. they don't tell you they, exactly yeah, they don't tell, how he died. Yeah, they don't tell us the cause of death exactly. But I'm assuming it had to be that because that's most of the people who die from alcohol poisoning die by suffocation. Or just over drinking, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, because, I mean, some people do, I guess, die from the actual poisoning, but that's pretty rare. Yeah. Um, And even dying from suffocation is, is rare. Like, it, it's just, it, it's not a, it's not a way that people commit suicide. People don't, like, go out and think to themselves, I'm going to kill myself tonight and, like, drink a lot. Yeah, and there's that, the way Hiragi keeps talking, he's like, I knew, I knew everything and I didn't do anything. And I'm like, what What exactly did you know? Because I feel like there's more he knew about Yuki that was going on that he's not telling Mafuyu. And, like, Mafuyu yeah. feels like, like, Mafuyu found him and then it feels like he's entirely responsible. When there probably was more going on with Yuki for him to, like, drink himself to death. Like, beyond yeah. just, like, a little fight that they had. Like, I don't believe that that's the cause of this. But, yeah, yeah. So, so something else is going on here, and then I and I don't think he meant to commit suicide at all. I think it's just one of those things when you're young. Some people have accidents and they die, and it and it happens. Um, and people blame each other, and it was just in a weird situation. But yeah, mm-hmm. Mafuyu tells Hiraki and Shisu like to come to the live if they want. Like he he tells Hiraki to tell Shisu he can come too if he wants. 
and he, he Mufuyu basically is like, I don't even know how to feel about it either still. Um, and Haraki's just like, well, more than anything, I want you to forgive me. And yeah, like you said, it's, it's not clear really what for yet. Um, and then at the very end of all of that conversation, we get a flashback of Mufuyu as a kid and Yuki comes up to him also as a kid and is like, can't you talk? And and Mufuyu's like, when I talk, my dad hits me. And, and then Yuki's like, but I'm not your dad. And I'm just like, well, that's not child ab- abuse or anything. <laughs> yeah. But it, yeah. also, it <laughs> sort of explains why he's so freaking quiet and reserved all the time. Because he's come from this abusive past where whenever he spoke up, he was slapped for it or whatever. Um, so that... I started to finally understand why he's like so ridiculously quiet all the time. Like, I think that's their reasoning behind that. I have more to say about this, but I'll let Kat finish first. Okay. But they all meet up for the rehearsal and a few still doesn't sing. He just stands there with the mic and like, doesn't say anything. (laughs) Um, And how did I not know until now that their band was called the seasons? I don't know why they mentioned it like really early and only like once. So yeah, it was kind of an aside. Uh, but yeah, it seems like they might be screwed at this point, and even Haruki is worried. And Ritsuka says right before that they go on, like we should just do not do vocals because Mafuyu doesn't have lyrics, and like we've never done vocals anyway. Mafuyu's like, this is the first time I've ever heard you give up, Ritsuka. You're always telling me to go for it that I can do it, and Ritsuka's like, well, you, time to face reality because you couldn't do it, and we're here, and you didn't do it. <laughs> and and Mufuyu like grips his guitar really hard and then his guitar string breaks and that's the end of the episode. So he's like so. really not going to sing this song in practice ever. He, he's going to sing it for the first time on stage. They've like contrived it that way. So Ritsuka gets to hear the words and everybody gets to hear it at the same time. Uh, and it'll be big dramatic performance next dramatic. episode. Dramatic. Yeah. So I had a slight reservation about this episode and this is more a commentary on like a lot of anime that deal with lgbt characters in that often anime writing comes from this sort of like outdated mindset in my opinion where you have you have to explain why a character is gay through experiences in their childhood so like when they talked about like the two of uh, Yuki and Mafuyu being latchkey kids who had single moms and no father, and how if if they'd only had a dad, maybe they wouldn't have needed each other so much, basically, is what they were implying. I was like, uh, I kind of cringed at that. And then later, when we found out that Mafuyu also was abused by his father, I, I was like... Oh, God. Like, because there's a lot of anime where LGBT characters have an abusive childhood, and I feel like it's just, like, there as, like, an explanation for why they are weird or different. And I just didn't like that in this sense. Though I I think in this anime, the abuse has another reason, like, for why he is the way he is, just personality-wise. Like, so quiet and uh, holding everything inside because he was abused for talking and being loud when he was a little kid. Um, but yeah, I, I still thought that was like worth mentioning as like a slight concern that like, come on, Japan, just get over that shit. But uh, yeah. Yep. Yep. I get that. But, but you know, it is still Japan and they can't, uh, they can't not have a reason because <laughs> all the Japanese people are like, but why? But why though? It can't be just genetics and biology. No. It can't just be that they like it that way. They have to have a reason. Because, yeah. like, puss- pussy is good. So, like, obviously, <laughs> if it's not going for that, then there has to be a reason. I mean, if it was so good, why is their birth rate so low? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So, let's talk about Vinland Saga. Vikings! Uh, hell Vikings, yeah. Vikings. Uh, episode 8, Beyond the Edge of the Sea. Uh, so Askeladd and his men sail home to the Jutland Peninsula, which is basically modern day Denmark and a little bit of northern Germany. Uh, and they're sailing home for the winter after a successful season of pillaging. Um, the village is governed by a feudal lord named Gorm, who Askeladd refers to as uncle. Um, and the villagers are all happy to see the treasures they've be- brought back. And they're also hyped because, like, a few crew members disappeared along the way. And what that means is that for a lot of these guys who were growing up and had stayed in the village, they have an opportunity to maybe go on next year's raids. Like, that's a—and make it big. Like, that's a big opportunity for Vikings. Um, 
Thorfinn bumps one of these villagers who's like kind of celebrating as he walks off the boat. And the guy's like, hey, where are your manners, kid? And Thorfinn just like slowly turns and gives him a fucking death glare. And the guy just like visibly like is like, what the hell's wrong with that guy? Uh, Doesn't want to deal with that. So meanwhile, all of the women in the village are trying to get Askeladd's attention as he like twirls some necklaces around his fingers um, there's also like this one woman all the way to the left who has a really deep manly voice and like a double chin is like huge. I thought that was interesting. Um, but yeah. yeah, he's clearly designed to be a fucking joke. <laughs> yeah, that seemed like a joke. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Danish women, I guess. Uh, there's also this <laughs> one, uh, oh, was it, what was I gonna say? Oh, uh, he's, so he's in talking to Gorm, Askeladd is. And Gorm is very preoccupied with, like, counting coins and money uh, to the point of being, like, obsessed with it. And Askeladd's like, hey, man, don't worry. We brought in a major haul. Like, whatever you, my uh, men eat this winter or whatever or drink, just charge it to me uh, because we brought home more than enough to cover it. Um, Gorm also has this slave girl named Hordeland who he bought from a lord's family in Norway, uh, who went into ruin because of a war that they became involved in, and they had to sell her off. And she's apparently kind of useless and spacey, according to Gorm. Uh, And Askeladd's like, well, the only reason your slave is useless is because of your poor handling. Uh, You can make use of any person. And as he says that, the camera pans back to Thorfinn's face, uh, who is getting ready to duel Askeladd finally after he's earned it. And Askeladd asks Gorm to be the witness. And when he says that, it's so positive and negative at the same time. <laughs> what, that you can, like, use and make use of anyone? Or... Yes. Yeah. It's... Agreed. <laughs> Not just a slave specifically, but use of anyone. Just think, like, maybe you're a manager and you have employees. Like, Oh, right. Yeah. yeah, like, using them to their... To their... For their best or their worst. And, like... Him telling him he's just basically mismanaging and like it's so positive and negative to me. I'm just like, <laughs> I don't know if I'm unsettled or and positive at the same time. <laughs> yeah, he'll clarify that a bit later in the episode too. We'll get right. into that. Yeah. So the duel is a lot more even matched than the last one they fought. Uh, Thorfinn attacks really quickly and skillfully with his short swords. He even knows to jump away when Asklad like swings really hard to break his swords and he gets out of there. Uh, but then he, Thorfinn rushes back in and like he parries Askeladd's sword and then goes for his sword hand, which surprises Askeladd. It forces him to drop his weapon or else get his fingers cut off. Um, but he then immediately reacts and Askeladd reaches for one of Thorfinn's sword, short swords to disarm him. And so Thorfinn has to jump back again to be a, avoid being disarmed himself. It was like a really nice quick sequence there of like quick thinking by both of them. Yeah. Um, and then Askeladd's like, all right, this kid is a little better, so I'm going to have to take another tactic. I'm going to get into his head. Uh, and he says, he pretends that he doesn't remember Tors' name. And he's like, I've killed so many men, I can't even remember if this Toral fellow was one of them. Dude, um, it's so obvious. He's just fucking <laughs> egging him on. It's Oh, yeah. Like, like I it, that hurt this episode a little bit for me, because I'm like, mm-hmm. it's completely obvious what he's doing and yeah and you think he would well but he's still a teenager yeah he's still young but i feel like he would i i feel like he's smarter than that he should have caught on it's it, i mean it, it doesn't matter how smart you are sometimes like there are certain things that just touch a nerve and you see red you know and that that's one of those things for him like anything yeah, about but his he father had to go on and on and <laughs> on and on to get him to do it so i'm just like he should have known by that point. Yeah, it was he, so he long. Well, he, I mean, at the end of this, like Askeladd, base, or sorry, Thorfinn rushes Askeladd, and Askeladd uses his losing control to just completely like wreck him, disarm him, dis- dislocate his shoulder. Because um, yeah, Askeladd's like, I can't believe your father was. He was that fool who gave up his life in exchange for a boy, and so yeah, like that was the last straw. And even Askeladd says, like, oh, you learned your lesson. You, you shouldn't lose control, <laughs> basically. Uh, so, yeah, it was just, like, a whole... I mean, it, Askeladd is a, a bastard, but he's also kind of taking Thorfinn under his wing at the same time, I guess, in a way. 
Uh, so you could see him in a positive light, kind of. But yeah. Um, Asgard and his men, they go feast on sausage, mutton, and beer that night. Uh, and Thorfinn just like guards the boats while he's out in the snow and the cold because he just doesn't want to be around anyone after losing. Um, one of the villagers inside the like feasting lodge, whatever, asks Askeladd why he keeps Thorfinn around, and like he, he's like, "Oh, you could just he could kill you in your sleep," and he's like, "No, he's bound by pride and yep. by his past." Which is dumb, which is really dumb. Like if I was him and I wanted to avenge my dad so bad, like he wants to, you just stab him a bunch of times in his sleep. No, they established that very early on. Well, I know. I remember the scene. Him. Yeah. No, but, I'm like, just, I thought well, that was really about him not being ready to kill anyone in general. No, it's not. It's more about, like, my he wants father to be like was his an father. honorable warrior. That's this, stupid. This, he doesn't want to stoop to Askeladd's dishonorable not, level. There, there yeah. is no honorable warrior. No, no, yeah, no there is, though. He, there hates, is. he hates Askeladd because of the way he was this armor to his father. So if he kills Askeladd in his sleep, he is being Askeladd. He is not being about like his father. Right. That's what war, grates war at him. Is it makes by perfect nature sense. not honorable. There <sighs> is no honorable But warrior. that's not that's how the warriors see it though. That people make up. Yeah, but that yeah, yeah. they make up those rules and then they but believe in them. But I feel like them. this whole anime yeah. is about how really there is not a lot of honor because you see all of this ugliness. That's true. That's it's definitely a, it's an fair. on and off thing, I would say. Mm -hmm. For the most part, yes. Um, so as uh, Thorfinn's like sitting out on the boat and like thinking about this. Uh, oh, oh, actually, sorry. Before that, uh, Hordaland uh, in the feast uh, area like drops a plate, and Gorm like comes and starts like berating her and then like whipping her across the back of the head. Um, yep. And this villager guy tells Asclad, oh, man, if I have to live like that without pride, like a slave, I'd rather just kill myself. Not that I know much about it. And Asclad had more interesting things to say than that guy because he looks at his uncle who is whipping Hordeland and says, a man slave to gold holds a whip and he beats the slave he bought with that gold as if to claim he is the master. He doesn't see it for himself, but every living human being is a slave to something. So he's implying that Gorm is a slave to money, uh, Thorfinn is a slave to his pride and his past, and he's manipulating these people because they're a slave to their emotions or something. Yeah. Um, their ideals. So as Thorfinn sits moping on the boat, he sees a vision of Tors, his father, appearing before him. And Tors is like, are you angry? And he tells him he knows Thorfinn won't listen to him, uh, but he shouldn't seek revenge. because. And he's like, I know you're not going to listen. It's something you're going to have to discover for yourself. But like I said before, you don't have any enemies. No one has any enemies. And a true warrior doesn't need a sword. Um, and at this point, like the vision of Tor Tors like kind of reaches to like comfort Thorfinn's shoulder. And he draws his short sword because he realizes in reality what's happening is somebody's reaching for him. And it's the slave girl, Hordaland, uh, who brought him a basket of food on Gorm's orders. And Hordalon asks Thorfinn if he's a slave as well, since he's, like, eating outside on the boat. And Thorfinn's like, we're nothing alike. Because he says if he was Hordaland, he would do what Cat would do and just kill this guy and run away. <laughs> um, and Hordaland's like, I could never kill anybody. Um, and she wonders, though, like, if I even ran away as far as I could, would it be any different, like, even across the sea? Because uh, she just imagines like the world would be the same with like slaves, traitors, and war everywhere. Um, and this kind of reminds Thorfinn of how Tors like saved that dying slave in the snowbank uh, back in the early episodes. And he decides to give Horderland some hope, saying that there is a place called Vinland uh, that he describes as a place that's free from war and slavery, which to me is a little bit hilarious because he's describing North America I and mean, even in <laughs> even in Native American yeah. society pre European colonization like there was slavery in Native American society you can look up Native American slavery on Wikipedia it's a thing I mean there was a whole goddamn civil war about it <laughs> Well that I mean that was a lot later Wait are you talking about a Native American civil war No they're not a Native American that was just part of culture in oh. Native American culture yeah, I'm talking about uh, the Civil War. Yeah, I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm talking about way, way back before European colonization. There was still already that stuff going on. Um, so it's a bit. I mean, of, exterminating the native people. No, I mean before Europeans ever got to here. Yeah, no, Native Americans oh, okay. enslaved each other. So, yeah. like, if a Native American tribe like raided another village, they would take those people as slaves. It was just accepted that that was the way it was. Mm-hmm. And it differed from like tribe to tribe, obviously, but like it did occur. Um, so like for, you know, maybe just Thorfinn's trying to give her hope and he doesn't know what the Finland is like either. He's never been there. So, um, the show then time skips to August of the following year, uh, 1013 in Jelling, Denmark, where warriors are gathering to go to war with England finally at King's Fane's command. Uh, there's also four brigades of those Yom's Vikings that Tors used to be a part of that are geared up and ready to go. Uh, and the king asks Floki if Canute has arrived. Uh, and apparently Canute is a prince who is a candidate to take the throne. Uh, but the king wants him to gain experience on the battlefield or else he might be usurped by his brother Harald. Um, and so the, an- the invasion makes quick progress beginning in northern England and like quickly moves south. But by October, they reach London, and that becomes like a holdout, like a choke point that slows down the Danish armies. And they sort of zoom in and like from like atop this big London bridge, uh, which I assume is above the River Thames, like uh, this fucking crazy soldier with blonde hair throws a hand axe, which <laughs> literally I counted hits like five Vikings. Like it t- cuts one guy's head off and like slices into like four more guys before it like lodges itself in the mass of a boat. And he smiles and he shouts, this is a fun war. Uh, and yeah, we'll, we'll find out later. This dude is named Thorkel. Uh, but he seems pretty badass for now. And for some reason, even though he looks like a Viking, he's uh, fighting on the side of the English. Uh, killing Vikings in longboats. So yeah. Thorkel is a very interesting character. He does seem very interesting. <laughs> he's a wild and crazy guy. Um yeah, I like that this episode. Sounds like a lot. you guys have seen the second episode, next episode. Jesus. I have not. I have not seen that episode. So. I have. <laughs> Interesting. Um, yeah, I. So I wonder if Hordaland is like a love interest for Thorfinn eventually, or if she just will fade fade into the background. I don't know. Seems like a love interest though. <laughs> uh, all right, ready for Carol and Tuesday? Yes. Yes. I love Led Zeppelin. Oh yeah, this episode's called Immigrant Song. Uh, <laughs> can you do can you do the vocal, Leo? Oh the <laughs> it's, a, ah, ah. <laughs> yeah. it's too high for anybody, like any human yeah, I, to really I'm do. Sorry, I cannot do that. That's <laughs> not enough to do it justice. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, episode twenty. Uh Gus has some good and bad Wait, news for I what? wonder if Kat even knows what we're talking about. What, the Led Zeppelin song? Immigrant Led song? Led Zeppelin immigrant song? I'm sure she's heard it. Dun, 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 Yeah, heard it. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, Gus has good news and bad news for the girls. The good news, they've been nominated for a Mars Grammy Award, so they still have Grammys on Mars. Good to know. Apparently. Uh, for yeah. the best new probably, artist. Probably still led by all white men. <laughs> 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 Very possible. In the uh, traditional they're, they're way. Immigrants, so I'm feeling like, yeah, it's still white men just running the whole thing. <laughs> um, yeah, and they've been invited to perform there. Uh, this is actually pretty ridiculous because Carol's like, you know, we've only just released our single so far. They haven't even put their album out yet, and they're still getting like nominated for Best New Artist. Well, it was specifically from the uh, concert they did, right? Yeah, the concert and yeah. the video and all the stuff has built up to this. And their their song has risen up to like number 18 on the charts, so I guess you can make an argument. Um but yeah, the bad news is that Angela also got nominated and is going to perform as well. So they got to go up against her. Uh, and most people think she's like the clear winner. Um, also nominated was that guy, Ezekiel, the guy who Carol seemed to know last episode. Yep. Um, so Dahlia is riding in a car with Angela and tells her that like after all of these years, she's c- so close to getting the Grammy Award. And this is what Dahlia has always planned for Angela to fulfill Dahlia's own dreams. Not really Angela's dreams. Yeah, um, this was like so fucking obvious. It was just like, 
<laughs> I know exactly where the story's going now. Oh, yeah. I mean, and Dahlia has like a little like something like feels like a heart attack almost. It's she calls so it a foreshadow. It's yeah. so it foreshadowed. It's very heavily, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> it is pretty laying it on a bit thick, yeah. Um, Mr. Tao gets called in to meet with Hoffner. Uh, and speaking of white guys running everything, uh, <laughs> yeah. he, he chews out Mr. Tao for uh, turning down Jerry's proposal to join Valerie's political campaign. Uh, apparently, Hoffner has been financing the campaign from behind the scenes because if she wins, he can control Mars as he pleases through her. Um, and so he's pressuring Tao into reconsidering his decision. Uh, but Tao is just like, no, I, I pursued my research because since I was a child... I've been like an emotionless robot and I wanted to find out what emotions other humans experience through my research. And his goal is to create AIs who feel emotions like humans and make music to evoke emotion in other people. But he never wants to use it for politics. That was never his goal. Um, so he like walks out of there. And so Tuesday cautions Carol about going to see Ezekiel, who she's like, He's kind of a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> Carol's like, I'm going to be that. fine Tuesday. <laughs> um, she just needs to uh, know if he's the same guy, like Amer, who she was best friends with at the re refugee camp growing up. Um, and Tuesday suggests like, well, you could get in contact with him by messaging him on Instagram and telling him something like only he would remember. So he doesn't think it's some fangirl or something. Have Have you guys ever met anybody from like, say elementary school that you ne didn't know up until now and they're the same person yeah i mean there, there's stuff that's oh you mean that they act like the same person you mean yeah like like you see them today and you're like oh yeah i totally see you being like this now considering how i knew you were in elementary uh, school mm, for me not really People change <laughs> change a lot, yeah. Yeah, people do oh. change. Oh, shit. My experience is completely different. Like, everybody I know today that knew from elementary school, except for maybe one, are exactly who I expected. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty impressive, actually. <laughs> there, is, there is one who was the quiet girl. She spoke in whispers <laughs> and said nothing. And now is, like, this fucking, like, like fake boo plastic surgery model type person doing car shows, washing cars, like crazy stuff. I was just like, whoa, <laughs> but that's it. That's it. Everybody else is just like, yeah, that's how I ac actually expect you to do the turnout. <laughs> that's interesting. I mean, yeah, like some people you can sort of tell they form I, their personality. But, I'm, yeah. I came from a country high school, elementary school. So yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, meanwhile, Tao calls Angela and Dahlia, who have arrived at the Artian's lab, and he's not there. And he hurriedly kind of tells them, I've completed the AI replica of Angela, and I've given it all the instructions for the Grammy performance so Angela can learn from it. Uh, and Angela's kind of pissed off that she's supposed to learn from her own, like, dummy. Um, and immediately after Which Tao... Oh, I what? understand. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand that too. And Dolly is like, oh, it'll be fine, Angela. Just do it. Just listen to Mr. Tao. And immediately after, Tao is taken in by these like authorities under the instruction of Hoffner, obviously. Because he's like, this is he's literally calling from the elevator in Hoffner's building. He's still going down. And when he gets to the lobby, he's getting taken in. Um, <laughs> we flip over to Ezekiel and his friends who are watching Valerie's anti-immigration speech on TV. Uh, when he gets the Instagram message from Carol and the message says, come see me pull off a popcorn bomb. Tat, would you yeah, send this God. message to a guy? <laughs> no, don't, don't do that. That's like, that's a bad idea. Like that. I don't know what a popcorn bomb is. I mean, obviously it Ezekiel sounds like knows. a venereal disease. <laughs> it does slightly. Yeah. <laughs> just like on the off chance he didn't remember what it was like she's got awkward. the popcorn Ugh. oh yikes <laughs> yikes keeps popping up everywhere um oh my God. in reality it's just a skateboard trick or like on her little scooter thing whatever um which she she has like a twisting flip on like a half pipe and she doesn't land it 
and Ezekiel's there, and he's like, you got kind of lousy at that girl, and he he shows off that he could still land one pretty easily. Uh, and they came up with this trick together back when they were refugees. Um, and Ezekiel explains to Carol that things didn't really go well for him after she left, because uh, he had to he had to run away from the refugee camp, and he didn't have an ID or a passport, and he had to basically just do what he could to survive, which probably was on the other side of the law most of the time. Um, however, Carol still remembers that Amara was the only one who cheered her on when she said she wanted to become a singer as a kid and didn't just laugh in her face. And she's thought about him like a friend ever since. Uh, but Amara says that a friendship between kids is like a pair of sneakers. And after 10 years, it's just, they don't fit anymore. Uh, he's the rapper Ezekiel now. And he says her pal Amara is dead. Um, which is pretty harsh. Yeah, it's kind of harsh. Yeah. So Ezekiel asks Carol like how he feels, um, or how she feels about what's happening with, on Mars with all the refugees, and how they're being treated like criminals and second ha- uh, second class citizens, and being told to just shut up and take it. Uh, and he tells Carol his next song is going to in- explode in their faces, and that things are getting a little chaotic probably after it's released. So it's probably better that they don't see each other again. So yeah. So he's basically predicting exactly what happens yeah yeah he knows the reaction he's gonna provoke yeah uh meanwhile tau has been arrested angela sees this on the news and like the newscast claims that like it's because he conducted illegal clinical trials on humans as a neuroscientist seven years ago but we know that's probably bullshit and that's like probably hoffner like owning the news and just telling them what to say didn't that come up before about what he did before the AI stuff? Maybe, but I don't know. I guess so, uh, there may be truth to this. Yeah, but for whatever reason, like it's coming out now, uh, which is obvious timing. Like they, they took what they could on him and made up a reason that he should go to jail, basically. Ruby, don't chew plastic. <laughs> Literally, she's chewing plastic. That Sorry. dog. <laughs> Why do you leave plastic laying around? Jeez. Yeah, cat. She finds it. Uh huh. Finds shit. I swear. She dug a little water bottle out of the trash. <laughs> Ugh. Uh, so Carol, I have like fifty toys for her. <laughs> she gets a water bottle out of the fucking trash. Anyway, sorry. Go <laughs> it's, ahead. It's fine. So Carol comes back home to Tuesday, and she decides to channel her feelings into writing a song for the Grammys. And so we get this like pretty sweet montage of them working on the song to some sort of like '80s groove type music, um, and it gives them the chance to show off like some nice character animation between the two of them. And like, it also ended with this really great shot of the girls like sitting back to back by the river. Uh, with the skyline behind them, which is now which my... Which made your background. Yeah, yeah. it's my desktop yeah. wallpaper. <laughs> yep, it's, it's real good. Um, and yeah, I think the song is called Beautiful Breakdown based on the lyrics, but I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure. Hmm. Um, when they get back to the studio, Ezekiel's new song is out. Oh, and, uh, it's you know, good. It's, it's really a really good song. fucking good. Yeah. <laughs> so it's So Ezekiel... In anime, his part is done by Denzel Curry, uh, who is an up and coming rapper. You, I am, I am yeah. really impressed by the genres of music, how broad it is they're doing for this show. Yeah, no, it's really ridiculous, it's amazing. Like, like I thought it was like really. I, I was like, oh, man, I'm really impressed. I think this is good. I love, especially, I really like the crystal stuff. Mm-hmm. And then they got to him, and I'm like. Wow, they're branching out this far, and it's actually, I actually kind of like it. What? Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a really good rap, and it's like really makes sense for the show because he's, you know, he's trying to be provocative, like in the music video that he makes. Like he, he's, yeah, he's intentionally, oh yeah, uh, fucking uh, edging on the political shit. So yeah, yeah it's, he definitely is. Woo. Yeah, and he's like he takes a bat to a TV that has Valerie's face speaking on it, smashes the screen. He lights his immigration papers on fire, uh, and like the fire, final lyrics of the rack or, rap are just like urging people like drop the crack, start a riot, flood the planet, be a tyrant, paint the streets, crash the server, express yourself, always be the converter. And so yeah, he's just trying to spur frustrated people into action with this song. Um, and yeah, like Denzel Curry is such an interesting guy. 
like I was wondering like why he might have been interested in like this specific part and just probably many reasons. But one of the things about him is that his brother was killed by police who tasered him and uh, pepper sprayed him and he had a bad reaction to the tasering and died. Oh, Uh, shit. Yeah, so, like, I could see why Denzel Curry might be interested in this type of part where, like, a character is sort of fighting back against these authorities. Um, yeah, so I feel like it it may have been coincidence that he wrote this the same way as, like, the exact be. political stuff that's coming on right now. But, like, now that you just said that, I'm just like, this seems a little intentional. <laughs> yeah, I think it's pretty intentional. <laughs> um uh, Tuesday's brother Spencer goes to meet with Kyle, that journalist, and he's kind of at a loss for what to do about his mom. And Kyle's like, all right, maybe we team up. And he tells Spencer that he believes Jerry. I like that he disagrees with his mom. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, he's been doing yeah. that for like a while now. He just hasn't done anything proactive about it. Yeah, but now he's making a uh, uh, an action to stop it, to something against it, at least. Yeah. Yeah, Kyle's like, we've kind of put together that Jerry was behind the bombing on the weather facility that, like, spurred on all this, like, uh, fear of, like, illegal immigrants and everything. Um, And, like, the evidence is that, like, the bomber's family was paid off by this company that is affiliated with one of Jerry's businesses. So there's a link there. And Spencer's like, I don't know if my mom knows about this, though. And Kyle's like, that's what I need you to figure out, if your mom knows. Um, What are you led to believe right now? I think she knows, but... I think she knows, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Meanwhile, here we have yet another anime, Promare being the other one we talked about last week, that is directly referencing ICE. Uh, And this one is even more direct, because these police officers break in on Ezekiel's guys. They are wearing uniforms that say MICE. They (laughs) they are the Mars Immigration and Customs Enforcement Group. I love that it's MICE. I love (laughs) It. It's funny. I love it. Yeah. But yeah, like never let anyone tell you that anime doesn't care about the greater political landscape of the world cuz yep, anime talks totally about politics all the time, the like all the time. Dating they're back to totally like the fucking 90s. Like, look at this. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome. Um so yeah, I had a small chuckle though that Amer's full name is Amer Soli Man. <laughs> Soli Man. <laughs> Soli Man. He's a very Soli Man. Uh, as the girls see him getting arrested on the news. Uh, The news claims he overstayed his visa after it expired 10 years ago. And Carol's like, this is bullshit. Something's wrong here. And Gus is like, well, they're just making an example of him because of what he did. Um, And so finally, the episode finishes out with a confrontation between Angela and Dahlia, where Angela's like, I've had enough of this shit. I don't want to follow the instructions of my AI doppelganger. And she tells Dahlia that, like, she's only making her do this to fulfill her own dreams. And Dahlia, like, loses her shit at Angela and finally lets, like, all this, like, rage out. Telling Angela, like, she's an ungrateful brat who doesn't even know who she is and she has nowhere else to go. And then Dahlia, like, collapses on the ground. (laughs) Yeah, She has, like, a heart attack or an aneurysm or both at the same time. I can't tell. And just collapses and... It's not looking good for Dolly. <laughs> uh, the, well, the way she went down looks more like an aneurysm because, like, a heart attack, like, he still have a, a, a slight control. Right. But, like, she just does, like, fucking face plants. Like, yep. no, nothing, no arms, no nothing. So, just like, ooh, it looks really bad. But we, we, we mean, we won't know until the next episode. So, we'll have to wait to find out. It's true. Yeah. We'll have to see what the mice do physically. <laughs> Huh. Well, and the thing was, us as we were as us, I was watching that episode, that scene. I was just like, call nine one one. Five, ten, fifteen seconds later, call nine one one already, please. <laughs> She's <laughs> uh, you're you're a, a father or well, mother recognizes mother. as Parent. your mother yeah. is collapsed called fucking 911 and then the episode ends and I'm just like <laughs> god damn it <laughs> uh yeah oh well, another part of like Ezekiel's rap that I forgot to mention that's kind of fits with the themes of the show is that he has like one line in there about how a lot of real music is being suppressed or is and in favor okay. of just like poppy garbage music that doesn't mean anything it's just, just another way of the show like telling us the same thing over and over again that like singer songwriter music that 
uh, that actually means something is what the show prefers over corporate produced garbaggio. Uh, garbaggio. <laughs> but yeah, that's you know that's the, that's the narrative the show is pushing. We've already talked about yeah. whether we agree or disagree with that. But yeah, yeah, it's cool. I want to hear more Ezekiel raps. Please give me more. Yes. Yeah. Uh, do we know who exactly wrote those? Uh, yeah, Denzel Curry wrote them for sure. Yeah. Okay. Oh, wow. cool. Yeah, cool. Uh, he had a he had a new album out earlier this year, which is pretty damn good too. Um, he's cool, and he's intense. He's an intense guy. Oh, fucking oh. soundtrack for this anime, guys! Holy fuck. Yeah, I think volume one of the soundtrack is already out. You could, like, order it. It pisses me off that it's really? in two volumes, mm-hmm. though. Uh, yeah, there's I'll a second volume to come. It. Yeah, and there'll probably be, like, more, like, little singles that'll leak out and stuff. Yeah. They always milk the music stuff in anime when they can, especially when it's like this with all these, like, famous people being a part of it. But, yeah. All right, Kat. Finish this thought off. All right. Well, that just sounds dirty. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> God damn it. That's why you gap. said it, you perv. I didn't say it. Like, I, as soon uh-huh. as I said it, I was like, fuck. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Remember to like, follow, and subscribe to us on YouTube to get updates on new podcasts or videos. You can also find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, and like every fucking other place. And follow <laughs> us on Twitter at Nerdum Another for updates as well. Um, hang out on our Discord, dudes. Like the dumbass if you're not on the discord then be on it the link's in the description and with that we'll see you guys next time it's getting close to halloween Ooh, spooky Ooh, yes All right. see you later later everybody